But at the same time, this guy puts out what he calls a quote unquote master class and charges like what was it, John? Like three hundred and fifty bucks or four hundred bucks. It was some ungodly amount. Well, and it's a it's yeah, it's a one time like six hour DVD you can buy. Yeah. And I'm just like, this guy's a fucking hack fraud. <laughs> oh, oh, really? Because Manal Abdumala says I would die. I was diagnosed with depression, anxiety, cancer, and <laughs> epilepsy, and had what? been living a colorless, hollow life. But then I come came across Sir Breen's fateful Sir Breen. findings, <laughs> and I found myself filled with spirit and learned how simply lucky I am to have seen his beautiful face. This, I, look, I don't want to say anything too bad about him, but this possibly could be a call. We need to call and check. We need a well, well welfare no, check. Uh, this on, is on obviously her. Mr. Breen's uh How dare you? Account. How but, dare uh, you? <laughs> a man who covers three quarters of the box art with his own face on every yes. movie that he makes. How dare I, I you? I won't Mr. read the other paragraph, but I will say thank you, Your Majesty Breen. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that for allowing me to witness goodness in human form. That is gracious. Well, can well, we get this guy to do our our I reviews? Would, we'll get our stars up. Oh, goody, goody, here it comes. Welcome to the Cinema Psycho Show. You are interested in the unknown, the mysterious, the unexplainable. That is why you are here. <laughs> oh, my God, don't stop now. With your hosts, Brian, John, and Elaine. Welcome to the Cinema Psycho Show, the madhouse for film freaks and film fans of all types. I'm your host, Brian Kyneton, joined by a fellow co-host and filmmaker, John Woozcroft. Butter. Butter. Inside jokes. Get, get, get the butter. Get the butter. Go get the butter. Go get the butter. Uh, yeah, our, our audience is going to be like, what the fuck did I just turn Well, that's on? every opening of our show. It is every opening. It is every We're on episode... 259 and uh this is a very special episode and one that kind of took me for a loop so um long story short we we tried to uh join a a website to help with getting podcast guests and working with different podcasters because you know it's fun we all got to work together right and uh i got an email from the person who runs that website and uh they had a proposition i'm just like i can't pass this up so uh, joining with us today is a very special conversation with uh, two producers. And I don't think we've ever had producers on the show. Have we had producers on the show, John? Uh, nope. We've nope. had makeup artists. We've had directors, writers, actors. But yeah, no producers. Never producers. So we've got all our fun producer questions that we're probably going to go off book and talk about ridiculous things. Because to be perfectly honest with you, we are starting about half an hour after the fact because <laughs> our guests... We're cracking this up with questions on oh, how Condor Forever it. was, how how podcasting works. It was great. Our and sexy, I'm, and sexy guests. Sexy, yeah. sexy guests. But we're joined today, and I'm I'm going to butcher Alex's name. I'm sorry in, in advance. We're joined with producers Alex Kalijian. Is that, pro- that correct? Close. Uh, Close. Collegian. 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 Okay. Yeah. And Ryan Gibson. Now, Alex, you might know of, as he is a producer, he of the and director of the film high voltage which i ryan you also were were producer on that as well right yeah yeah i was yep and uh alex is i guess i guess your claim to fame um is that you're the creator of project green light i am that's amazing (laughs) hey uh thank you brian you told me we were going to be talking about 80 for brady today <laughs> oh, oh, okay. oh, we are. Oh, we are. Oh, we are. Oh, we are. <laughs> oh, we are. <laughs> because I'm, I'm, I'm in line for it right now. I'm You're calling me live. I've been sleeping out That's on it. my uh, Patriots blankie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Project Greenlight. I'm amazed because, like, I remember watching it and uh, back back when it had premiered in 2000. I think 2001 was when it premiered, right? We premiered the week before 9-11. Of course. Because timing, great, right? Great timing. <laughs> great timing. <laughs> Fantastic. Great. When the country was ready for a new we, we, start. We bring, we bring good things to the world. I know when the world is burning, my career is going well because <laughs> uh, Trump was being uh, sworn into office when we were shooting High Voltage. So oh, I was like, course. okay, this is my life. Well, also, speaking of movies that are out right now, good thing that you guys didn't get the script for Plane. 
<laughs> hey, hey, hey. Now, wait a second. Alex and I have had some heavy conversations about playing. First of all, title. I mean, come on. Like, I, I, well, that that's the next title. Of the, the sequels will be called Title. title. <laughs> or just they'll go completely opposite. Instead of removing the word the, they'll just call it the. Oh yeah, they go the uh, they go the other way. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, you know, like Fast and Furious, they're like, well, we're just, it's the Fast and Furious, and then once we get to the sequel, it's just Fast and Furious. Right. The sequel should be called Ground. Ground. Yeah. <laughs> we well, I like when Meg for GN. Oh um, my God, yes. Like somebody was like, well, why don't they call the sequel Meg Five GN? But they're calling it like Megan Two Point It's like, uh, no, you no. had it right there in the thing with the thing. No. Yeah, I mean, um, they could have just taken the A and just put the four there. So we like Jerry Butler. Yes, and we, and okay. we like you guys like Jerry. Um, Come on, Brian. Yeah. John. Oh yeah, totally. Okay. And not and not oh, all. Yeah. Not I mean, like Den of Thieves over any Jennifer Aniston rom com or whatever, or his like prior work as a real actor. Like we like that he knows who he is. Mm -hmm. He likes who he is, and he does what he likes. So. Yeah, if there's a movie called Me Punch Bad Guy, we're there. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that all Liam Neeson movies, though? Me Punch Bad Guy? Yeah, and that's what you came for. Yes. You didn't come for the other thing. But you came for mac and cheese. And and when they put the fucking like, truffle oil on it, I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> no. So my, my, but my question is, do you, what, is the, what is the difference between, uh, and have they crossed that line? Has Gerard Butler or Liam Neeson crossed the line of where you get into guys who are pumping out like 10 movies a year that all are, you know. Care careful, brother. Yeah, careful, brother. Uh, <laughs> like, where's the, where's the, that's an inside joke. You, where, you mean the geezer teasers? <laughs> I like yeah, these guys. Already. I like these guys already. Yeah. So, <laughs> that, yeah. Yeah. So when 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 is have do you feel that Gerard but like because Gerard I watched that uh recently it was on television I I couldn't stop well I did stop but the the asteroids hitting the Earth uh and he's got a family uh, and they ouch get, my roids <laughs> <laughs> in, ouch my in, roids. inflammation too um yeah like no but lift. like do you feel like hurdy rock coming. Yeah. <laughs> do you uh do you think he's crossed that line maybe no i don't no. know even with plane no. i don't think he has no i think no. he's still and, uh, i'll tell you what it is so guys you you're opening up a we're actually like very deep in this world right now on another project so called here's, car here's, it's it, called in, car. A, in essence it's a car movie well, i called, actually like, said yeah. to alex the other day i was like you know with this whole new dynamic that gerard butler has started i think we should call the script car or Vroom. Or Vroom. Vroom. Yeah. <laughs> Vroom. That just we'll sounds Vroom. too much like an animated movie like Wait, Cars. The sequel would be Vroom uh, Vroom. Yeah. Uh, exactly. You Now you're in. Transfer. Yeah. No. Or the number of um, uh, exclamation points di dictates which, like, in the series it is. But um, wait, 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 wait. I would also like to say, if you're familiar with the whole transmogrifier business model, I think oh, car, yes. if we could do the box art like cars, but have it be like an ultra violent car chase movie <laughs> and just get it next to so the kids at Blockbuster, when they come in, they get confused <laughs> and we can get some sales. <laughs> at what blockbuster are actually you going that's to? called that's called <laughs> stolen valor stolen okay. oh yeah stolen valor <laughs> um no guys what what it brings up and and by the way we're happy to do it like um i'm very excited about this it is called i mean it is a simple title it's called firebird it's about a firebird get it so nice. um but uh you know i mean i i'm about to to preach the benefits of the simple man while also uh, quoting an obscure movie so welcome to our it world. might not be that obscure for us okay Just are you familiar you with preston sturge's sullivan's travels no no okay <laughs> stump <the pain>. you <laughs> stumped us okay <laughs> old movie that's why uh at 1941 okay and the basic premise is because from project Greenlight, from how i got greenlit like it's clear we love Movies about movies, stories about movies. Right. So in this case, it's about a Hollywood director named John Sullivan, who's riding high in his career, um, but uh, in in sort of a, a genre guy. Very, very popular, you know, in the box office, but maybe not the most artistic work. And he says, hey, man, I'm an artist. You know, I've got to make my my work. I've got to, like, go deeper here. 
So he decides to go undercover as a homeless person to gain the life experience necessary to tell a real story, <laughs> you know, a film of, of worth. Right. And so by the end, and I hate to give it away, but please do watch the movie. It's great. Um, the end of the film is he's in a, like a hobo camp and they, somebody's thrown up a sheet on a barn and like showed an old movie and it's a Mickey Mouse movie. And he's in this room of hungry, tired people who have, you know, have really at the end of their line and they're laughing at Mickey Mouse and they're getting catharsis from Mickey Mouse. And he realizes that genre movies have their place and it's all, you know, don't be, a, don't be so poncy and fancy. And so to take it to today, I feel like, you know, our business is suffering from the broccoli movie. And that's not the broccolis that made the James Bond movies. What I mean to say is something that's good for you and you better eat it. And if you look at what's winning Oscars and what's winning film festivals, it's broccoli movies. Yeah. It's more about the subject matter and the virtue signaled within than about the craft, the framing, the acting, the editing, the mise-en-scene. And I thought that that's what it was about. I thought you were going to be judged on the making of the film. But it turns out mostly now the broccoli movie wins because it's got vitamins and minerals and it's good for you. And we're in a tough time right now. I mean, tough as I've seen. And people are struggling. And, uh, you know, I want a comfort film. I want to escape. So... You know, you could ding me and Ryan and say, oh, you guys are just making a genre movie, whatever. You guys are cheese balls. I don't care what you think. I want to see this movie. I need this escape in my life. That's you know? awesome. And you know what it reminds me of is um, the the rise of the Universal Monster movies. So, yes. Like those movies came From about that era. Yeah. in the 30s when the Depression was going on. Exactly. And people flocked yeah. to them. Because they needed that Escapism. escape. Yep. You know, yep. you're you're dealing with bread lines every day. People are out of work. You got people who are, you know, that their whole life savings are destroyed. And you know what they want? They don't want something that is pure drama that no. is about the human condition. No, they want to see Bell Lugosi's Dracula. They want to see yeah, Boris Karloff or a musical. Or a musical. They, yeah. And, yeah. And by the way, that's what the that's the brands that went went that way. Warner Brothers gave you yep. gangster movies so you could shoot, you know, shoot it out and feel that catharsis of I wish I could rob a bank. Yeah. Right. Uh monster movies, obviously complete pure fantasy, um, a thrill ride, and then you're done and you go home and you eat your shoe. But like, <laughs> you know, uh with you know, gravy. And, and, and each and each studio had it, right? So Universal was the monsters, Warner Brothers was the gangsters, you know, George Raff, Shane. And then uh you had um uh MGM did the 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 musicals with the tuxedos and I think MGM and Fred also Astaire. did like the big epics too. Oh, and then they would do that too. They but I think the musicals, yeah. you know, paid paid for the uh the gun with the winds of I, the world and such. I don't think, you know, look, uh, obviously there's a little being a little dramatic but you know i i think really what it comes down to is you can't slight look there's there are these levels and you know i heard you guys talk about um you know uh the new pinhead movie and uh, yes and uh still pinning still pin still pin into <laughs> electric <laughs> electric boogaloo um, no that was like hellraiser po like eight. poke on <laughs> through to one. the other side what was this one called uh and like i i think you know when you watch somebody's film and it just it is so and i i, I know i know you guys know this i can hear it when you guys are talking about it it doesn't it, it's so hard to make these things i mean they were mo they were making i was shooting a uh movie in belgrade at the same time they were shooting that uh the new pinhead movie right um and uh it's just oh i thought you said glass onion well how many films were going on in three Soviet? three wow yeah they were shooting glass they were shooting uh the second glass onion which so here's the here's the difference glass onion and the new the next one to come out yeah they were given he was given 475 million dollars wow i'm not even joking <laughs> this is a real number was so, he shooting both of them at the same time you know they did back to back okay they did, they did back to back so they were shooting well wait what's the 
so you're saying they're not doing block shooting of two films, but they literally what wrap one and they're in pre on the other? Is that what back? Yeah, to I think I, no. that's what I that's what I understood like, was happening. Back I to could the future be pre, you know. Ex- yeah, yeah. Although I I don't know, did they block shoot uh, two and three? They might have block shot that. It, are you talking about Lord of the Rings? No, he, or, Back to the Future. He said. Oh yeah, yes, they did. I believe that's the whole. That was their whole logic. Was like, hey, we're you know we're going to bang out everything we can for both movies that's because it's cheaper style, right? it's cheaper to yeah shoot. why cheaper. schlep back to the mountain or the whatever just get it all done they just shoot i mean you, you know what location. block shooting by the way you you know what block shooting mean you you guys sometimes we use terminology we usually explain ourselves on i'm our assuming shows. it is just shooting at you know at the same T- time yeah right? yeah tv shows yeah kind of like pioneered it. it's basically like you know i don't know pick it a law show right so you're going to have your courtroom set so the actors I mean, it's a challenge. It's like, all right, for two weeks, you're going to be in this stupid law, uh, the the stupid courtroom. We're going to change your clothes, and it's going to be three different cases. But right. we're going to rattle this out, and you know? it'll okay. be from three different episodes. So the impo- yeah, yeah, all like, okay, okay, you're si- you're winning in this one, and you're losing in this one, <laughs> and you know, yeah. Uh, anyway, so um, well, my, I, I guess my point is is that it's really hard to get these things made, and a, and a, any movie, any, any budget, yeah, and and then you have the 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 movies that are getting 200 and some million per yeah uh and then you're getting and then you're and taking advantage of film credits and stuff going in europe just to squeeze that much more out of your budget and then you have movies like the new hellraiser which was significantly less than that and is that true yeah i don't i don't think i don't think they spent 475 million on hell the new hellraiser i could (laughs) i could be (laughs) wrong I no, could I be don't wrong. Think they did. But 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 you know it, it's there's a there is this quite cuz really to make things work nowadays some films are being shot in 12 days. 12 days. That's insane. You say that like we didn't shoot in 15 days. Well, that I mean, I think the quality speaks for itself. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Oh, I uh oh, I don't boy. pull punches. Um That's great. I love the fact you don't pull punches. It's good. Yeah. So it, it's it's look. It's a monumental task to even get go get going. You're talking about yeah. years. And, and, and once you make a film, years. yeah. Once you make your own film and you're not gigging on somebody else's, you really, I, I it, it, it's kind of like the Big Short where they're like, and then Mark never said I told you so again. You know, it's like yeah. I never shit on a movie again after making my own. I depend. Like, it depends on that. I, I agree there, with Brian. There, it depends because, like, I'm sorry. It, like, you, you guys are familiar with like Neil Breen, right? Are you familiar with him? Is he was he an actor? At one no, time? I, no, he was a real estate agent, and he has made a name for himself for making what John and I would consider the most unwatchable films of all time. John, would you agree with that? Oh yeah, is he I mean, like well, a Tommy Wiseau type? Yeah, cat? Like yeah. Self funded. Yeah. I mean, it depends on how drunk or high you are, and how many <laughs> how many people you're watching it with. Of course, for this show, we usually watch them by ourselves sober, and it's a nightmare. It's 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 a fucking. Yeah. Nightmare. What's the title? Oh, there are so many. He has. Oh no, has I'm, I'm looking now. Twisted so, Pair is the new is the one that John and I have. Fateful to findings. Fateful findings. Double down. Oh yeah, Fateful findings Pass is his cinema. T H R U. Yeah. Fateful Findings is what I would call his uh, Citizen Kane, um, <laughs> because you know, pretty pretty much, you know, it, he he pretty much broke on the scene with Double Down, um, which he's always playing the same fucking character. He, oh, he's the star. He's the star the yeah. who either has one. He's a secret agent who tries to uncover what is going on with the government and saving the environment at the exact same time. And usually is naked with a woman, very attractive woman. He's, I'm sorry, he is not a good looking oh, man. Oh, I do but, know this guy. But he, yeah. So this man, quite You're talking about him. Talking I, about I get that. And, I, and I've gone back and I've said this, is that he is a success in the fact that we know about him, that other people know him, that he's popular in the cult film scene. But at the same time, this guy puts out what he calls a quote unquote master class and charges like what was it, John, like three hundred and fifty bucks or four hundred bucks 
It was some ungodly amount. Well, and it's a, it's yeah, it's a one time like six hour DVD you can buy. Yeah, and I'm just like, this guy's a fucking hack fraud. <laughs> oh, oh, really? Because Manal Abdumala says I would die. I was diagnosed with depression, anxiety, cancer, and epilepsy, and had what? been living a colorless, hollow life. But then I come came across Sir Breen's fateful Sir Breen. findings. <laughs> And I found myself filled with spirit and learned how simply lucky I am to have seen his beautiful face. This, I, look, I don't want to say anything too bad about him, but this possibly could be a cult. We need to call and check. We need a well, well, welfare no, check. Uh, this on, is on obviously her. Mr. Breen's. Uh, how dare you? Account. How but, dare uh, you? <laughs> a man who covers three quarters of the box art with his own face on every yes. movie that he makes. How dare you? I, I won't you, read sir? the other paragraph, but I will say thank you, Your Majesty Breen. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That for allowing me to witness goodness in human form. That is gracious. Well, can well, we get this guy to do our our I reviews? Would, we'll get our stars up. See, our- he he's great. He's the kind of guy who became independently wealthy and decides without any training or knowledge, or maybe ever ever seen one, he's gonna make a movie. <laughs> yes. But- but there's there there is something to be said, and I, look, you guys are going to kill me for saying this. We're not going to. He's putting. Oh, please do. Uh, they, they. He's putting his own money. Into yeah, these do things. what you want. Do what you want. You're hiring DPs and PAs and there's fucking no, look, 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 there's look, no look, DP. Here, here, here. Here. <laughs> <laughs> there's there, you are giving him way he's too jo- much. He's fucking a job credit. creator. He's a job he's, creator. Hold on. Okay? Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> you have to understand something as bad as you think when you're watching this, and you're like, I'm going to stab my own eyes out. Do you understand that there were people there were PAs and people who worked on this and who actually hopefully, hopefully got paid. There's no way they got paid. And, and, I, and, and, and had to sit, watch this happen in front of them for like, could have been as many as 20 or 22 days. Well, just, just think of that. If, if you just what taking the time to watch it one time is one thing, but imagine working on it day after day after day. Well, it's, gentlemen, look, I do I, think I, this I'm, might be a cult. I'm defending him. I'm defending. This him. might, this right? might be I, a no, cult. No, 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 I'm defending. I'm defending. I reached okay? out I'm to defending. one of the actresses though, and yeah, I finally did. found one person who was involved in it, and she got like really chilly and odd when I brought up the fact that she was in his first movie, and then she just like stopped speaking with me and. <laughs> <laughs> wow and did you have to say the code word i'm like Eskimo. yeah i'm like oh is, uh, do you do you live in spawn ranch with charlie <laughs> like is, yeah. uh, wow. look he good on him okay good on him I, as i said I, I haven't seen him i'll watch you you, you tell can't. me if don't tell me which one to watch don't do it I, I, like, okay, like if, i haven't seen the room you know like i just look at those from afar and i go whatever good on him roger corman's movies suck have you ever watched one yeah they're, like, pretty they're not bad. good they're pretty bad and he just kind of like you know buys another fucking monet and wipes his ass with it so <laughs> like it doesn't matter like if if there's an odd, if he's made five, I guess, or more. Oh no, he's made like, a ton. He, he has a new one that right. he's coming out with. You know, um, you know what we say, and I'll I'll speak for Ryan. You know, what we say when people are like, "Why are you making this movie?" Whatever movie's in front of us, and uh, you know what we say, so we can make the next one. It is kind of true. That's a good way of putting it. I again, like I never, I never shit on anyone who makes their own movie because John and I have both done it, and it is very tiring and very long and very exhausting and we've only really done it on the short scale of it i can't even imagine on the the feature side as you both have but even that is it's an it's a it's yeoman's work like it's uh, it's thankless and then you get and then you get like look there are a lot of movies who deserve to get kicked in the teeth there's just i mean but i think part of this and i think this was a part of something that you guys we were talking about in email Mm -hmm. When you create, and I think when one of your po- your latest podcasts, you talked about this, and this is very poignant. Uh, and this happened for us during high voltage. Yeah. When your budget is a number and you can't go over that number, but you're trying to get as close to it as possible and you see that the tarmac is ending, mm-hmm. you have to make creative changes that on the fly and i think this is what really makes an excellent director uh, and producing team that on the fly in production you have to be like you know that part of the story that really kind of sums everything up well we don't have the money to do that so how can we solve that 
and still maintain creative integrity. And that is very tough. That is, that's really tough. It's tough to maintain your creative integrity as a, as a team, let alone a director or a writer and, and work within the confines of an ever dwindling budget. But and don't I, you, don't you feel that that um, constraint though ends up breeding the most creativity that's like if, what that's what you guys that's yeah, exactly yeah. what you guys said on that on the one of the shows that i was listening yeah. to is that doesn't that breed i would argue in a vacuum yes uh and i and i get the point exactly uh and i'm not just agreeing with the show host that we're on no you don't you don't have to you you can you can say you don't know what the fuck you're talking about no you no know, like, no no i i but think you can't does, Brian. but not <laughs> 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 but not every it uh, and alex can speak to this uh, you know i've directed some i've never directed a feature but i've directed commercials and yeah. i did my own i've done my own shorts and I, all that stuff but i i think that you find that in a vacuum yes that's true but so, you know sometimes the rubber doesn't hit the road because you're just you have to do so much in the 12 hours right. that you're you know and then if you're the director it's like 18 12. hours well yeah, that's exactly. what i'm saying well look uh yeah i mean uh it's a hard knock life for us you know mm -hmm. but uh it, we, we love it we do it we're dysfunctional what the fuck else are we going to do at this point you know um i know who i am he knows who he is uh this is who we are um and would we take disney's call oh I, I, yeah sure oh yeah i mean that look i we're we're ready to be selling out and uh you know <laughs> there's a there's a price tag on our the the, the little bow on our panties you know oh we we've, uh, we've done that with shutter every single time that we <laughs> do a movie and we're like this is on shutter John pretty much will go, what will you say, John? <laughs> well, I, I mentioned that we are not financed in any way by Shutter, but we will sell out like whores. Oh, yeah. Just, total yeah. whores. Yeah. For yeah. Shutter. I mean, well, be, again, <laughs> because why? Because, like, I mean, even this Tommy. What, what's Tommy was so. No, but what, Neil. Oh, Breen. Neil Breen. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah uh, I, I mean, all unless he really is made of money, I I, I don't think he would have made the second one unless someone out there was watching. Yeah, there someone. has to be an audience for that. There's, There's just, just some no way he's dropping yeah. even. I mean, because like the cheapest pot, like if he had a video camera and like uh you know clip mics or and three he's other people, he's got plenty of laptops. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, laptop. He has <laughs> laptops, laptops out the ass. Uh, but yeah, and that, look, that's the fun thing about the film business is it attracts, <laughs> as my dad says about L.A., you know, oh, it's flakes, fruits and nuts. It's like a bowl of mucilix out there. You know? <laughs> I'm not sure that he, uh, any of that was politically correct by your 80 year old I, 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 father. But I'm just telling you, he's from, a, he's <laughs> he's, from another generation. Hey, he's 80 for Brady. It's OK. You know, right. exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. Way to bring it around. Um, no, it's just that it 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 attracts more interesting personalities than electrical engineering here, you know here's it's a, just tell them the story alex that here here's the funny thing too you guys have made your own stuff yeah but there are there are people who and Al, i've gotten calls alex just recently got a few calls and we talked about this um he and i were talking about this a, a woman I'll, I'll let you tell it alex talk about the engineer yeah, yeah. So, and this was already like a friend of a friend of a friend. So, yeah. I think everybody that we know that works in the business will get a call once a month, twice a month, email, text, whatever. Hey, I'm a friend of your friend of your friend. And they said that you work in the business and I'm curious about it and I want to work in the business. It's usually, you know, student level people or maybe just out of school. Right. But sometimes it's like, you know, the like, I really hate my career. I need to make a, a radical change type person. This person was that. She was probably, you know, early to mid 30s, a working construction engineer. And, you know, to be an engineer, a lot of training, a lot of permitting. I mean, it's a, it's a hard job and it takes a long time to get to do it. So, um, and she's like, yeah, I've had it. And I've always thought about filmmaking and I thought maybe I would do that. And I'm like, um, <laughs> okay, first step, don't quit your job. No, <laughs> <laughs> don't do it. You're, you're already making a lot of money. Yeah. So I'm like, just keep, 
doing that. <laughs> and then on the side, yeah, yeah. So it, you know, I, I give a lot of cutesy analogies. One of them is like, uh, okay, great. So now, um, Bruce Wayne will continue to be a construction engineer and Batman will start to pull on the cowl after you get home from the construction site and go out and wage a war, a one man war against crime. So that means start writing your script or start, you know, breaking down a, a short film that you want to make or start, you know, working the five, six hours after you're done working the, you know, eight to 12 hours. And if you have that commitment, do that for a couple of years right. and start to lay the groundwork. But really it's that thing where, you know, even when Ryan and I started where you're doing a day job and it may or may not be in the business. And sometimes it isn't because being a PA for 13 hours and then coming home and writing your script is not tenable. You're on your feet, yep. you're exhausted, whatever. Sometimes it's better to just gig on like, all kinds of, oh yeah, data entry, uh, you know, for a wall street firm or whatever, all the bullshit jobs that I did. And, and, and then you can, you don't care about it. You're not putting your back into it. You're doing the job, you're taking the money and you're, you know, you're working towards your real self or your true self. And it's a lot of that. It's just, it's, it's, it's tests, right? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, what Ryan's point was, is like, for some reason people think their career sucks and this one is easy and we're you know <laughs> easy we're just blowing our not, nose with <laughs> easy is not what i would describe the yeah, film industry and so, by any stretch just, <laughs> or maybe it's just it's a wish fulfillment like well at least it's sexy or whatever but it's you it know, seems it's, glamorous it's, it's, i would say yeah. it does go seem glamorous and go I, to go film in palm springs in 117 degree <laughs> heat and go to the porta potty after <laughs> after lunch <laughs> and then think about glamour, my friends. There's gla there's real liquid glamour in there. Uh, I, you know, I, I think the uh, I, I think to, to expand on the point, I also think that look, uh, we're in this world where 33 percent of people in the you know 18 to 24 range are listing their hopeful career as being a creator, um, mm -hmm. and and that used to be instead of being a creator they used to be um youtubers influencer or influencer influencer, yeah. influencer. that's my that's creators. my personal favorite is influencer and and god bless them you know i don't have i i you know i have the a face for podcasting so uh <laughs> I, I i'm not i just don't see myself going down that road um and so god bless them for being able to monetize whatever they're you know they've attracted on it and look like some guys like mr beast and this They've made so much money and also are giving back. But I think this culture of a uh, creator, when people see they turn on a ring light and a camera uh, in their bedroom, in their bedroom, talking about their life. Oh, I could do that. I could do that. It's kind of like my kid could paint that. I mean, there's always been a like outside looking in like, ah, maybe I'll do that. And, and, you know, kudos to people who decide to reinvent themselves. I'm, I'm not against that at you all. Absolutely you absolutely should. You absolutely should do it. Life. Like life yeah. is short. Do I, whatever the fuck you want. I mean, I'll, just, I'll just be honest remember with you. It's going to cost. I'll be honest with you. I, I worked a job that I hated for nine years and the pandemic allowed me to reassess. Values. I think this is a lot. This happened to and, a lot. And that was that. I mean, I, I've heard about it. It's a lot of people were just like, I could die tomorrow because of a fucking virus. And it's like, do I really want to spend my time at a job that I hate? And so, like, for me, I, I you know, fortunately, I have a wife that supports me and supported me in this decision. And I, I dove into teaching film because that's what I was doing. Uh, as, as an adjunct and i was like let's do it for a year and it was not easy i'm not gonna lie and say it was easy but it w it was a step and then just happenstance ended up working in the podcast industry um and and it's it but it all goes back to had i not made that decision to finally put my own mental health my own things of what i wanted to do first that i would not have been where i'm at now and that's what I would tell that that engineer is just like work on the stuff you want to do, get the experience, but you know also be realistic. You know you're not you're not going to be on the red carpet. 
you know, yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. 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 <laughs> or, you know, the, the one for them. Develop the your skill. Like, That's what I would do tell both everybody. at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And she was even shocked. Like, wait, I could do, I could enter a short in the Sundance and there's no barrier to entry. I'm like, they're happy to take your money. They get 20. Oh yeah. Every film year. festival will be happy to take yeah. your money. They have so no let's problem. just tell everybody like <laughs> make a short film on your phone. Do what Steven Soderbergh's been saying for 20 years. Make a short film on your phone yeah. and then watch it and then show it to other people. If they like it, yeah, pay the $100 to enter in, into film festivals. Who cares? It's a shot on goal. Or honestly, I would even say this. Put it on YouTube. Put it on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Like that, that's, I, would tell, I would tell that anyone now. I would say, you know, because I, I have a lot of friends who they'll, 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 they'll waste their money on film festivals. I understand why they do it. Um, but they'll spend, you know, a huge chunk on film festivals, thousands, thousands no, of dollars and never, easily, no chance, no, no chance, chance because, at all. Well, the problem is, is, and I've told this to them, I'm like, listen, you got to understand programmers of these film festivals have X amount of spaces to program films. Okay. And some of those might be for features. Some of those might be for shorts and they're going to pick movies that fit those boxes. They are not necessarily always going to pick ones that are the best movies. I can make a 21 minute short film that is the Citizen Kane of short films. But guess what? If the film festival programmer is going to look at my look at their schedule and go, well, I can do five mediocre films that are maybe, you know, five minutes long. And or I could do this one 21 minute one. Which one is going to get more attention? Which one's going to get more, um, you know, uh, ticket sales brought in than the 20, 21 minute one? It's, it's going to be the five. So, like, I always tell people, I'm like, you know, there's we're, we're at a point in our in, in time in media where you literally can put your movie up publicly on YouTube. And then, yeah, you've got the problem now of, you know, oversaturation YouTube. What do you do then? Yeah. Then it becomes marketing. Then it becomes publicity. Yeah. And that's the world, we, you know, we all on this call around. Yeah. You know, I mean, I hate to tell you, but we're all quote unquote creators now in somebody's idea. I'm right? definitely not yeah. an influencer. So I'll take that. Well, title I'm just creator. saying we're, we're here's, here's what it is. We're creating we're, it's a cottage we, industry. We generate we're making content. it at home. We're generating content. And we're like, as you said, we're throwing it into the ocean of stuff that people can listen, yeah. play, watch. Uh, kill time before they meet, you know, their mortal coil, leave this mortal coil, you know. So we are in that camp. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's why we're here and that's why you're having us. So we can combine and we're glad, our glad audiences. To have and, oh. Yeah. And we're, and we're glad to be here. Yeah. So it's just like, it, it, it's an interesting time. And, and, you know, we all, certainly Ryan and I have seen it all change in front of our very right. eyes. Now you have worldwide distribution in your fucking hip pocket. Like that was the like craziest change right. of all. And now it's the opposite. Oh, well, yeah. So what are you going to do about it? Right. Before it was the other, the barrier to entry was actually getting on a screen somewhere. Yeah. So there's always going to be a challenge. Why? Because there's always going to be 10,000 more people that want that job of director or producer or DP than, than is necessary. Right. It's just always going to be highly competitive oh. so the question becomes how how are you getting it well i will back brian up and say uh, i will say yeah tr go go the route of youtube but i will say don't don't do vimeo nobody no. cares you sanctimonious prick you know? uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's well that's the joke right but, but, but they um, curate they but they curate stuff guys so maybe we yeah oh yes so they curate it to five people <laughs> <laughs> to five percent yeah. yeah right and that's so i mean let's not go down did we the, get really it, yeah. did it get depressing <laughs> no it just got very <laughs> like processing all of a sudden. the last 10 minutes yeah. was it all like sad well, so was lobot a cyborg or was that <laughs> 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 and is lobot somehow related to the marvel universe of course it's related to the marvel well, universe uh, yeah <laughs> well, it's, uh, ooh, he's a mutant it's only so long before mickey mouse is in the next star wars movie you know but I remember seeing when they first when they first did the deal, and of course somebody did the Mickey as Darth Vader yes, or Mickey on as South Wolverine. Park. Yes, and I was just like, "Yep, here we go." <laughs> till, till all, well, gosh, it's it's clobbering. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> till all are one. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, gentlemen, speaking of being a creator, uh, can you tell us what exactly a producer is? Because I 
adventure that most people don't exactly know yeah. what that means other than they get the Oscar for best picture. <laughs> well, uh, uh, Ryan, I'll let you feel that while I go produce up a cup of coffee. All right. <laughs> uh, all right. While he's going, folks, here we go. No, um, the I think there are there are several different forms of producer. There are uh, producers who uh, have uh, like tangential relationships with talent who help uh, who are like talent whispers who have access to talent, who can get talent into projects and who um, operate in that field. Now, all of these can be cross, um, uh, modalities i guess like you can have several of these things in one producer but the, I, I i'll break them down in what i i think it is and i i can i could get killed for this but this is what i think there are also creative producers which is a job every producer would love to have but hollywood is not high there's not ever a job listing for a creative producer which is someone who helps shepherd and develop um stories scripts and and it's a very long process and it can take years and years and years to do this and usually there's not just someone like paying you to sit around and read scripts and i mean there are these people obviously but to be a creative there's a that's a kind of producer a creative producer and that is someone who focuses mainly on sitting next to the director going through with the writers and shepherding a project from you know maybe it's just an idea to being a full-blown project right there's your day-to-day -day operational producers uh who are like uh, uh line producers uh who take the script and functionally break down how much above the line atl or below the line btl uh how much these things are going to cost down to how much or the btk killer the btk killers or how much it's going to cost down to how much does it cost the guy at 12 o'clock at night to come out and pick up the garbage from the set and those are that's the line producer and that those are those are kind of the three what i was saying alex is that the three producers that i kind of see are the creative producers which we would all love to be but it's not a hireable position Brian Grazer. Right. I mean, there are people like Netflix paid uh, who uh, uh, Ryan, uh, what's his Coogler. name? Coogler. Coogler. I mean, he's, they, these, guys, these folks who have directed stuff and really uh, made some really cool things. And then they get some big deal with like Netflix, which, by the way, those, I think those days are gone too. Oh, those are totally gone. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> Wait until the uh, AR VR billionaires come into Hollywood with their big ideas hey, like netflix every 10 years cool. yeah what whatever the new platform like biotech or whatever is going to like be the next trillion dollar business in 10 years some of those people will decide they know how to make movies better than there is else. nothing just, there's, there's an inevitable like curve there's nothing more than hollywood loves than uh and and alex has this great uh the thing about the the walled city um, but there's nothing more than the Hollywood, which I stole from David Milch, by the way. But oh, all right. Well, the good you're giving credit. Uh, then to have multi-millionaires or billionaires come into town, try to make a movie, and kick them directly in the teeth and send them home packing. There's not Hollywood just there. I think they just love to do that. Am I wrong or am I right about this? Uh, yeah, they call it dumb money. That's what they've always called it. I mean, it could uh, that Coca-Cola buying Columbia. It could be that's you know there was that's a, great for me to hear because I always thought it was the opposite. I always thought it was like they want that venture capitalist money. So oh, the, no, they do. Oh, oh, they oh love yeah, it. they do. They love, they love it, but they 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 take them for a ride and then they you know they dump them out of the car on uh, off the I nine or whatever you know like <laughs> they they um it, it's just it, it i mean look i was talking to, <laughs> you'll love this ryan i went to cinephile video the other day uh -huh. um i took my son because to, i my son's like i want to see 2001 i'm like do not watch it on tv do not watch it on your phone just wait just wait just wait so i finally took them they're doing a retrospective um at the uh oh shit what is it called anyway one of the retrospective cinemas and so we were watching it and there's cinephiles video which is like the last nerd store oh this is time. the place that's in right on the edge of the of santa monica right 
it's Sautel yeah, and yeah. Uh, yeah. Santa Monica. Yeah. yeah. So I go in there. There's a video store. You know, so guys, it's a th- yeah. to, 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 to paint the picture. There's a uh, lovely old theater with a beautiful marquee still. They do Rocky. It's where they do Rocky Horror Picture Show. Every Friday. It's the new heart. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The new art. It's right off the 405. I highly anyone to know. What is it go. with you, California people? The, and describing. The, I knew. I knew what you were, road. I knew day. you were going to say that. Yeah. I yeah. knew this was uh, going to happen. I'm all. Yeah. No. So. Anyway, so uh, location, we go in there, location, location, and, location. and we were just browsing, just screwing around. I was a, looking at like it was one of the Italian last video spaghetti stores. Western posters. Yes, one of the last and video so, stores is right next. To and we rented the original Old Boy because for some reason you can only get the shitty Spike Lee remake. So, yeah. um, and the guy was talking about, you know, I don't know why this thing doesn't have distribution. And by the way, you better return this copy. This is my only one. And I had to fight for it. I'm like, sure, man. And he's like, I think it was like some it was like shampoo company or whatever. Like he knew all the the obscurities. I, I don't know if you guys know this, but like, you know, throughout time, like bizarre comers to the film business just decide to like set up film funds, yeah. you know, and uh and, and and sometimes great movies come out of it. Like Aaron Spelling made a, a big pile of money and started like spelling films and some good films came out of it. Like bizarre, like, wait, David Lynch was working with Aaron Spelling, shit like that. And so in this case, I believe it, it was like, um, you know, the Breck shampoo company had a film company and like, you know, obviously Coca-Cola and like Sony Electronics and just the Gol- bizarre Western golf and Western, golf and Western. Western you know, we the which, you know, golf and Western. Well, did they talk about blue horns, like made all his money from like slave labor on like cane sugar plantations. I mean, there's all yeah. kinds of stories in the naked city, but it all boils down to some very rich person always love film and they have more money than they know what to do with. So they decide to either start a film fund, uh, buy a studio, you know, and so on and so forth. You know, the, 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 all the oil companies that bought up uh, the, the studios in the seventies, you know, it just goes on and on. So now, you know, just, you can kind of see, like, if you just wanted a history of like the, the you, you know, the economic times in, in Western civilization, just track who buys a film company. And 10 years before that was the like, you know, emergent uh, economic, you know, turn of the time. Right. right. So I'm, I'm, bluntly serious like whatever the next big you know if like the the lithium mines of uh, argentina explode in the next 10 years which i imagine they will we are going to see some elon musk you know dude coming out or lady coming out of south america like i know how to make films i make lithium Par- you know paramount studios <laughs> paramount studios brought to you by pfizer yeah. Wait. <laughs> I mean, so b- you- by the way, yeah. if they can figure out some <laughs> angle, you know, and they'll tell us, and the, and the secret, you know, meeting will be like, you know, uh, as long as your film can portray the healthcare industry positively, we'll be like, oh boy, well, we'll make it work, sir. Whatever you say, aye, sir. Aye. Wait. So, you did know? you say that old boy was financed by a shampoo company? Is that? Uh, we were getting down the road. There is a, a legend that the. Uh, um, somebody did that i don't know if it's specific to this but we were we were it it, we basically had this very same conversation in like five minutes over like a you know a cash register the guy was like oh shit you know shit oh okay oh you know know (laughs) yeah yeah don't Uh, (laughs) don't step don't step don't step into one of the last video stores in los angeles and not know your shit or you will get flamed yes and this guy was exactly right he had the like fucking sniper sunglasses on he had the the, uh like members only jacket like original not like redo you know like he was my man like in fact ryan i was gonna tell you like we should have this guy on i mean he's just fucking great because david was like wow like that was real like that wasn't like a parody i'm like no that guy's real you you run <laughs> like, into people all the time that are just in and this is why i love like meeting you guys and yeah. being on your show is that uh talking about this stuff it just it's fills me full of so much joy because we really love talking to people 
who love movies and also hate movies at times and and hold them mostly. well because the cynicism is born from the you know the the optimist that's had his heart broken too many times that's right you know? totally. and that's that's what it is and look i was listening to uh to danny houston um talk about his father mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's just, that's part of why I love this business is that it refuses to go completely corporate as much as people want it to. Right. Um, so like, if you look at the Netflix culture, the Netflix culture is a tech culture, you know, yeah. but the weirdos refuse to be like held down too long. Like you can't quite um reform the mavericks of this of this world and we're and we're some of them you know like it, it, it we just don't fit anywhere else so this is where we are and a lot of a lot of people will come in and try to like assert their authority with money and culture and whatever but it's just too weird there's too many weirdos there's too many like eccentrics that came here to get away from all that so the system will continue to try to um create some sort of process in which the mavericks the weirdos the you know iconoclast will be knuckled under and it just never works it never well, works. i think i think a lot of it comes down to like you, you saying the the weirdos and i always view that that the the, the true creators of, of hollywood even this goes down to like you know the producers the 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 grips, PAs, director, actors, all of them are in essence, you know, kids who still are playing with action figures. Adults. Oh, I, yeah. I, yeah. Oh, no, yeah. We, we, we never, we never stopped. Like, that's the thing is, is we maybe started with, you know, like for me, uh, was Batman action figures and like that was it, creating stories. And, you know, ultimately we graduated to people and filming those things. And trying to craft those stories together into a brand new thing. So, like, we we never grew up from that, you know. No, no, no. no. Look, you, look and and thank God, pick. just get my get, get under budget. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and, hence, hence the producer conversation. I will say this too. This goes all the way back. I mean, Alex and I uh, on one of our we just uh, did a show with um uh what's Alex who is our boss before. I keep forgetting his name. Uh, uh, we just yeah, we just did. Yeah. Gary Carter. Gary Carter. So Gary Carter, uh, Alex and I worked for him. Uh, if you look him up, he's, I mean, big brother. Uh, uh, what else, Alex? Um, survivor. I mean, he, he was basically, uh, do you know who John DeMall is? Um, I'm yeah. unaware. He, All right. There's a company. There's a company called Endemol, and uh, basically a Dutch company. And basically, they created the modern reality explosion. So they started with Big Brother. They had you know hands in Survivor. Gary himself is almost this like you know zealot like figure, but Survivor. Uh, American Idol, mm -hmm. um, Big Brother, like every major hit of that. He was you know, in the, it. the explosion. He, he, he was, was in it. He was either creating or in the room or, you know, whatever. And, and so was, say what you, sorry to interrupt, say what you want yeah. about reality, uh, television, what you think of it. I'm sure you know someone who is, just, uh, you know, addicted to one of his things that he's touched. Probably. I mean, we were talking about tent pole shows in the last 25 years. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but his love for cinema and movies is so great that the movie he brought to us was Salome. Is that, is that how you pronounce it? S Salome. Sal it's Salome. The, the, the biblical story. It was a, uh, silent film made in the twenties. And it was, I did not know this, but it was directed, uh, it was directed, uh, written, produced, uh, uh just across the board her production through her production through her production we're talking 1920 yeah 1922 22. 1922 and by a, uh nazimova uh, yeah russian uh a russian actress one of the highest paid actresses of, the, of her time I, again guys i did not know this a, a known you know they everybody says oh the liberals or whatever this is not about liberal or conservative or anything like that but this woman was a uh, known she was a known lesbian and was had her own company in Hollywood 
and did this, you know, put her money behind this short or this film that's a biblical story of Salome. And uh, it was fascinating. It was fascinating. And it these are people who were born in the 1800s, right. you know, and they were making a movie and in, in silent movie in 1920 that when you watch it, you're like, how the hell did they do this? Like, yeah. And it went from a play written by Oscar Wilde. It was just fascinating. What we love about our show is when people bring us these movies and we have to kind of do some homework and it's, it's, it's kind of cool. I mean, it's the whole point of it is we're trying to turn other people on into less known movies. Right. So he certainly turned us on to something and it, it, it bore a whole conversation. I guess, I guess the, the woman's, I guess, well, go ahead. Yeah, I guess my point, anyway, we can go down the rabbit hole with that, but right. that, that episode will be coming out. My, but, my, um, my point is, is that the, the weirdos and the freaks and whatever, you know, you play with toys and you're still playing with big toys. That's been happening for literally a hundred years. Like, yeah. yeah. The- oh, so I found it. Brute Productions, a division of Fabergé. Now, for all the oldsters out there, Fabergé was, and I told two friends, and, they- and so on, <laughs> and so on, and so on. And they took that money from that the, the big success of the 70s and started Brute Productions. Uh, like you know, the brute. Uh, I think it was uh, men's. It was. You know, it was like you, after right? after yeah. shave. It was like you put yeah, it on after yeah, shave. And they made like thirty films, and of course, you know, ate shit and went away. But like for a moment there, they were riding high, baby. They were making red you know, carpets and champagne uh, all around. Yeah. Everyone, Roger, Roger Moore, Cary Grant, Robert Vaughn. You know, like. <laughs> Liz Taylor, baby, Cannon, we got Cannon Fabergé. Mo- we got shampoo money. What do you? So making, did they? Baby? Did they make Old Boy? Did they help fund that? No, no. Oh, but I just love oh, that the yeah. guy knew. I mean, that was going deep in the paint, and he was like, "You're one of us." I mean, he didn't say it, but I could tell in his eyes. Alex He's does like, have an amazing encyclopedia of film. Just off, like I can tell. It's uh, <laughs> un- it's actually. I feel. Always the highlight of their of their uh, of their au vieux would be without a doubt whiffs starring Elliot Gould oh, and God. Eddie Albert. I've never heard of this movie. Whiffs. Whiffs. W W H I. The most hilarious military farce since Mash. W H I F F. Okay, I'm sorry. The minute that anyone says the most hilarious or most greatest thing, it it, it spells it. Oh, it bad. always is. Well, and it because it's is. an Elliot Gould movie, so it's oh well, there you go. After a group of gullible military private volunteers to be the subject of biological and chemical experiments, oh, later rob banks ensued. as a result. Oh my God! All right, guys, we're gonna we're gonna just stop now and watch this <laughs> group watch. I mean, anyway, that's that's sorry, but that's go. that's literally <laughs> classic. That's yeah. literally what <laughs> Battlefield Earth was supposed to be. This is gonna be the greatest movie since Star Wars, and well, no, I think that's another <laughs> thing we that w- I think we also don't realize is that there are you know Alex and I. One of the reasons why we started how uh, uh, you know how I got greenlit is we would be on set and talking to folks who are in their, you know, early twenties and mention a movie, uh, a, a like, yeah, we literally, so the, on high voltage, there's a shot of a reflection in a toaster of the main character to sort of indicate like she's changing, you know? Right. And that was a direct rip off of, um, a very almost identical shot from Rosemary's baby. Yeah. Right where she's starting to think she's going crazy, so I said, "Okay, guys, we're going to do a little rip off here. See, you know, we're going to catch this one's for the for the for real fans, and we're going to do a total rip off homage of this." And they're like, "What's Rosemary's Baby?" Oh, fuck, what? Shot fuck those want? kids, dude. What? <laughs> Uh, and and my it was that was our reaction. We we're like we were like, all right, everybody stop, put down what you're doing. Who who's seen the yeah? Not, thing? We're not going to say fuck like you a third of the gotta, set, and it was all people over like forty. John works and in a movie like, theater, okay. and he I, have you encountered that same thing, John? Uh, more than I would like to say. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. I've encountered it with college students because I I still teach um, visual effects and animation. And every once in a while, just because of the way my brain's wired, I will use movies as an analogy, right? And mm-hmm. I remember one time I said, it, you know, something was like, uh, you know, Brendan Fraser in, in Encino Man. And someone's like, what's Encino Man? I'm like, fuck, what? <laughs> Brian, Brian, there's a big difference between <laughs> Rosemary's Baby and Encino Man. I <laughs> disagree. So, so says I you, disagree. John. So says you, John. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. I, I, I'm sorry. It's a classic. 
<laughs> yes, and you wouldn't man. have the yeah, whale. Cino man is a classic. You're exactly. You would right. not Wait, have the, the fucking whale argument? if you didn't have Encino man. Okay. <laughs> You know, he almost didn't get airheads because Polly Shore had so much sway. He's like, nah, bruh, we might want to make Encino Man too. <laughs> so don't hire him. Right, which is our business in a nutshell. You're <laughs> under the fucking thumb of Polly fucking Shore. <laughs> There's always um, a Polly Shore. <laughs> hey, you know, I, I just shit on whiffs. You know what this guy also directed? Oh, Good guys wear black. Boom. Oh, okay. Go tell the Spartans. Boom. Magnum Force. Boom. Magnum Beneath force. the Planet of the Apes. Boom. Hang them high. So, you know, you can shit on anybody you want. Like, the, the, if this guy lived to 95, he would not be killed. <laughs> <laughs> he was the Rasputin of the film industry. Yeah, man. <laughs> Literally, by had the way, to cut off his that, that is half the business. I, I had a very, like, powerful, irascible lawyer for many years. And, uh, you know, I would come meet him on one series like, oh, you're still around. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, man, they can't kill you. You're one of these knock around guys. Like you just refuse to leave. I'm like, exactly. Uh, you know, that's exactly right. Beneath the Planet of the Apes. That movie kind of messed with me when I was a kid because the ending is like the universe explodes. <laughs> like, wow. That, that's nihilistic. Isn't it? That's entertainment. Yeah. <laughs> It, um, you, anyway, should we go back to producers? What, what were we talking about? Yeah, so producers in a nutshell. <laughs> uh, Dear listener, right. 30 uh, minutes later, we're still talking about producers they're, in a nutshell. They're, you know, they're, <laughs> they're first in, last out. Yeah. Is a good way to put it. You know, you they're find, the first one like, what if we did this? You know, find the money, find the talent, keep everything together, massage egos, um, make sure that the toilets are clean. Literally, make sure food lunch is there on time. Uh, make sure the unions are happy. Um, and and then there's and then you know I get to work with Alex in in you know being a creative producer as well, which is you know that's a dumb idea, Alex, or that's a fucking great idea, Alex. Like you know you add your creative spin, and Alex has had we've had fights over this before. We get into a lot of uh, rows. Where I, you know, he, he, it's pronounced row shit. Sorry. There you go. <laughs> um, and then we, uh, we have this, uh, crew. It's daddy shithead. We, we have, uh, we have creative differences and then I ignore everything that he's spouting off similar to what I'm doing now <laughs> and, and just try to guide the ship. And, and so, and the real true job of a producer would not exist if everything on a film set or during film production or post-production or pre-production went smoothly, every, <laughs> every, funny. it's a problem. It's a pro you are, yeah. you're the, you, you're the fixer. The fixer. You, you're the, you are yeah. the fixer. You're the Michael Clayton. Anytime. <laughs> I'm not the bad guy here. Then who are you? And uh, that's the thing is even now, you know, and I probably shouldn't say this, but I'll play it for him later at, when we're on set. But, you know, I'm, uh, when it gets closer to real, mm -hmm. I'm allied with the producers until I have to tell them, okay, now you're the bad guys. Right. Wink. And they go, right. Wink. And then I ally myself with the cast and the crew. And it's us against the producers because you need a bad guy. Right. So I know, having played both roles, that the producers are the good guy. They, 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 they fucking cleared the brush to make this field that we're playing on. But now we have to change history and say, these vulgarian money counting sons of bitches are, are trying are against us. Right gang. And they go, yeah. And at every juncture, I try to uh, portray them as the villains because that means the tribe in order to create tribal harmony you need an exterior enemy so I'll give you a good example uh, we're making high voltage you know we're cutting corners everywhere and by the way I'm 
I'm the main producer, but I had to kind of set that down and let these guys be the producers. So they save money. One of our other producers, Dwan Fox, he saves money by finding a cheaper caterer. Well, oops, you know, we went a little too far and they were a little too cheap and the food was not great. So, you know, you try to keep your, you, here's a trick to keep your crew on set. You serve free breakfast. So they'll show up early, they'll eat and they'll be there at call time. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I look over the entire camera crew is leaving the set and I pull the DP. I go, where are you guys going? We're going to shoot in like half an hour. Ah, these guys don't like the breakfast. We're going to go down the hill and get like some real food. I'm like, what? And so, <laughs> so, so I had a very public and kind of staged fight with the producer in front of them. Lies. Lies. <laughs> <laughs> Where it was like, you sons of bitches, these people are working their asses off. Why don't you feed them something good? This fucking dog food isn't worthy of anybody. You know, just to, and then they're like, oh, he's our guy. He's on our So side. then, so I've been in the seat several times where the crew is like, the director is a human piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> and please, producer man, save us because <laughs> we are we are going to revolt right and that is the other side of the coin and by the way if you think every movie that you love is fascinating and wonderful and you see all these bts things where people are hugging and talking and oh it's 100 blah, 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 blah. watch the jim carrey uh doc where yeah. he where the making of man in the moon because yeah. If people didn't want to murder that fool uh, I, <laughs> from from literally the last PA to the fucking t the head of universe. Well, was it universal or? Yeah, I think. Whoever yeah, whoever it was. was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they made it at universal. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I, I'd be I was surprised he even lived through that process is because <laughs> that, by the way, just a little inside scoop, uh, Coca-Cola and coffee. Those are the two main things you have to have on set when you're making a movie. If you do not, not Pepsi, have those, can't Pepsi. I don't want to go against Pepsi because they could be, you know, <laughs> Pepsi. <laughs> I'm sorry, but wild cherry Pepsi is compared to cherry Coke. There's no, there's no, there's no question. Oh, no, yeah, isn't, no. isn't, isn't Pittsburgh a, a, a Pepsi town? It depends. No, no, we're a pop town. Well, yeah, there's, pop, there's no, pop, there's no, pop, there's no, uh, no, uh, there's you know, no soda. so yeah, we don't call it soda. Although I'm originally from California, so I've always called it soda. Um, but I'm I call a it weirdo. soda too, Brian. You, you, you what do you call, what do you call shoes that Nike makes? Sneakers. Shoes? No, tennis shoes. Wrong. Uh, <laughs> okay. And, then, and that's shoes. And, yeah. The, that and that's T E N N A tennis shoes. Tenna. All right. Where anyway, where we well, go? That's the pop well, soda thing. I was just gonna say one one of the most amazing true behind the scene things I've ever seen was what, during the making of The Shining, and everybody thinks I'm gonna mention like Stanley Kubrick and Shelley Duvall, but no, it was. Literally, I think it was a like a PA handing Jack Nicholson after 12, 13 hours of shooting, like some new lines for him to learn before tomorrow. <laughs> and he knows he's being filmed. So but you can tell that he's he's controlled pissed because he's on camera. But you can tell that he's just <laughs> exhausted and so annoyed. I'm like, that is the most perfect encapsulation of the movie making process. It doesn't yeah. matter how who how small or how large the talent or the the talent is at dp or actually the the, the actors it, it doesn't matter who they are and what level they are at any time on a set they will become completely unreasonable and maybe for good reason it, it's long days long mm -hmm. hours and it's time consuming and it's it, it it it's like watching paint dry and and it's just funny when someone who is like background actor three uh loses their shit and you're like Run. <laughs> i i'm not sure you qualify i, I don't know as a part of your contract you can actually say some of these things that you're saying to me because you're <laughs> way off right now anyway we can cut that part
<laughs> oh, I got to cut that part? <laughs> no, I'm just uh, no. I'm just saying it wasn't as entertaining as I had originally. No, it's it entertaining. All all this nothing's getting cut. I'm just telling you right now. This whole whole thing is going out. Um <laughs> what what so, net, what where where well, where can we go next? Well, I I thought we were going to debate hard bodies versus uh ski, ski patrol. patrol. <laughs> was that not this episode? Oh, uh, well, um just yeah. a quick, quick note here, guys. Uh, I try not to look at my phone when we record, but when you mentioned whiffs, I had to Google it. And the Los Angeles Times called it as funny as a fire in an old folks home. <laughs> that's pro- I don't even know if that's good oh or bad. God. Is that good or bad? Well, did you? Well, wait, did you, just be honest, and, and there is no wrong answer here. Did you actually watch High Voltage? Uh, I saw the trailer for it. I have not okay. had a chance to watch it yet. That's so. That's that's go no 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 go go look up some of the reviews <laughs> if you want to see i saw you on the, the red the carpet Asmi premiere or, like is that clips oh, on youtube nice so you did an image search well good. Oh, no. yeah, <laughs> by that by- john did you did you did you watch it or not i know brian you didn't watch it either did you john i did not know <sighs> thank prep thank god. <laughs> prep boys thank prep thank god um no, no, I what I said to Ryan was because you guys obviously you go deep in the pain of like your sort of um, I wouldn't call it review, but like a, a discussion and and uh, overview of films. Yeah, that you, yeah, you love get fair shake. You hate and, Yeah, you you go you go in there. So I, I'd be curious to hear what you really thought. Okay, um, it, it, like un like unexpurgedly, like be truthful. But but I I just laugh because uh, we got meaner reviews than that. I think that's and, be just because like the environment. The, yeah. Yeah. And the envi- right. and I also think like the mean reviews are easier to do. It's easier to criticize for the negative than to look at the positive. Like and it's that's quite, it's that's quite a zinger from the LA Times though. Funnier well, than a fire at old folks home. That's a good one. <laughs> I mean, yeah. But I, I guess I guess for me, like when we've attacked not attacked. But when we have the first oh, attacks, yeah, oh, John, yeah. Attacked. there's there's been some attacks. When, I, when I'm we, the dick. <laughs> yeah, John's usually the dick. I I try to be the the you know scrotal sack, if you will. <laughs> um, but but no, usually usually when we look at a movie that's an indie film, especially, and honestly, I'd look at this with high voltage. Um, we try to do what's positive and what's what's not, and we do it in a way that's constructive. That's kind of the way we all do it. Always do it. Now, as I said, that's different from, say, an awesomely bad, which I, I don't think I would consider high voltage to be awesomely bad, at least from the trailer. I mean, it just it seems very much like a mishmash of rock and roll, horror and sci fi. And mm-hmm. I'm curious, how how do you how do you balance that? Like, how do you th- those types of genres? How do you mix those together in a way that that works? Well, you know, so this is uh, do you know what a tweener is? No. Well, should yeah, I, I didn't know what either. a tweener is? Uh, well, now you will. <laughs> I don't know if you should. Um, I like when movies do that. Okay. Like, I appreciate that because I like all three of those yeah. things, right? It's sort of like a milkshake, with, you know, or like one of those ice cream places where they're like, mix this and this and this, yeah. right? So like cold stuff. that's what I wanted. To, right. And th- yes, exactly. And and so they say, you know, make what you want to see. So I like all three of those genres and I wanted to try to blend them. Right. So uh, and and some of it was uh, meant to and some of it was came about. So, you know, I had a I, I was in a band uh, many years ago. And so I based the story on a real story. And a lot of strange things happen in that real story By the way, so if, if you're writing you that's what you should do right yeah, yeah you should try to crib like some of the more interesting events of your life into some kind of story and whatever <laughs> so i presented that to our mutual friend this guy named evan ostrowski who produced cabin fever mm-hmm. right and and you know in retrospect what i realized about opinions is that uh you know in the same if you've heard the old expression like you know, a hammer only sees nails in life. Right. Uh, a the person you're asking the opinion of is going to see it through the lens that they are or that they have from their experience. Right. right. So his impression was nobody gives a shit about your indie drama about a band. Make it a genre movie so you can actually like make people their money back. And that was a fair, That's fair. 
uh, from the, response. From the guy who helped bring Cabin Fever to life. Right. And so what he said, make it a horror movie. And I said, okay. So I took the, you know, the, the bones of that kind of three hander, like indie drama about a band. And I put it into a horror context. And from that, it became like a kind of Kubrickian dark sci-fi thing. Mm -hmm. And so the script itself, the original script that we, you know, got raised the money off of and got cast was a lot more stuff. It was like a treatise on religion and a future dystopia and a this and a that and 40 other things because I like all those right. things and I wanted to put them in a blender. And it was more like that. Like, here's one for, for my people, not, you know, a weepy drama, blah, 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 when Sundance and there's wheelchairs involved and whatever. So <laughs> I, uh, um, that was the intention, but then you go to, uh, us trying to raise the money and that's a whole nother skill set that I had to learn. Right. Basically, what happened was is Project Greenlight came back uh, for another iteration uh, a few years yeah. back. And the producers said, you know, hey, you know, you're going to hear what do you need from me? And they said nothing. Just send us your address. Here's a check. And I'm like, great. So it was like pennies from heaven. And I thought, all right. I've been out here all this time and I've done all these things, but I never did what I intended to do, which is make my own film. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to take this money and this is going to be my investment. And I'm going to spend one full year from today to try to raise money to make my own movie. And so that's what I did. And I made it with like two days to spare. And nice. I had to learn how to raise money. I had to learn how to be a little business guy you know, a little enterpriser, as they say on uh, risky business. And so um, that was a whole learning curve. And that was a whole, you know, adventure unto itself. And basically, it boiled down to I raised half the money by December 15th. And Ryan and the other producers were like, you can't do it for this money. Like there's this script will not you can't fit 12 pounds of shit in a one pound. It was bag. a really it, the original script for hollow body was really well that by the way high voltage right. was called hollow right. body until right. the, the original script for high voltage hollow body was uh i don't want to say a completely different movie but it was a really it, it uh, you know it's easy to say this um in hindsight but really truthfully I, it was a it was a really good script it, it had it had elements in it that unfortunately due to uh, funding it, we couldn't do and then you're forced to make these creative yeah so so here was the story so so half the money december 15th i flew into chicago to meet with some venture capitalists as like a last minute you know try and we had a bake-off there was five other filmmakers that had to pitch their films to this like you know flash dance board of like judges st sitting there and uh and i pulled it off and they gave us the money. So they matched what money we had and we had enough to make a film. But the, you know, come to Jesus moment was Ryan and the other producers were like, great, you can make a movie. You just can't make this movie. Right. So I cut about 30, maybe 20 to 30 pages at out of that original least, script. At least, yeah. Yeah. To make, you know, it was like, let's say a hundred page and we shot like 80 or something. And, but the, the crucial part was what I was cutting was what made it not what made it unique, but just the bigger ambitious idea right. basically. Right. So I'm proud of what we did and it is, uh, it does function as its own, uh, uh, unique, um, self-sustaining story, but the other layer of commentary upon it, which is what the kind of point of why I wrote it, it, it didn't remain. It just, it wasn't there. So, and the, what we ended up and, with, well, which, when you, the tweener, I, I, the tweener you, I think yeah. And so the tween, the tween problem is this, the tween problem is, um, it's neither an indie drama nor a horror movie. It's both. Right. So you end up uh, alienating both groups as opposed to bringing in both into a bigger tent. Now, the distributors said tweener. They said, look, 
you either need more blood or more tears. Right. Because, and if it's more blood, we're in. And if it's more tears, we're not interested because we're genre distributors. Right. right. So uh, we ended up, you know, cutting it to be a little more horror y. But the problem was, and this is a big one for all kinds of movies today, which is you saw a trailer, but I'd be interested for you to see the movie after that and say well wait a second well that's not necessarily i mean the shots were from the movie but that trailer led me to believe it was much more of a graphic horror movie and there's and it's it's not it's just not yeah. it's a thriller but i wouldn't call it like a blood and guts horror movie. and there's it's one thriller. thing that you never want to do as a filmmaker is if you get the horror audience hooked by your trailer and you're promising blood and blood count and you don't body count, body count yeah. and you don't deliver that you are going to get housed oh yeah no, yeah no. yeah and it's expectations nice. right like anything in life if you expect to be to get this and you get that it's not just that you're like mellow about it you're like i was misled you sold me a bill of goods right and a lot of reviews are that a lot of the reactions are that wait a second the trailer made me think x but it's really it's, y it's as funny opposed to you bring up about the trailer so like i don't know if you listened to our episode on the monsters um that we oh, did God. the the rob zombies the new monsters, rob zombies yeah. uh fuck around <laughs> you know monsters i saw i saw the new trailer and and, not and the, the problem the thing i said when we did that review was that you know a lot of people were saying oh the monsters is not half bad as the trailer and i'm like yeah the trailer everyone who worked at universal uh 1616 and made that trailer should be fired because the trailer <laughs> for the monsters was the worst piece of shit I'd ever seen. It actually made me not want to see the monsters. That's, well, that's I'm actually that's a the fan thing. of the monsters. That's the thing. And is, zombie too. I mean, I'm a fan of zombie as a musician. I'm not a fan of him as a filmmaker. Um, I'm a fan of his as an actor. I, yeah, yeah, come on. Man. Okay. I'm a, lot a, of I'm a fan of his as a hair. Oh, hair as model, a hair model. For sure. Yeah, but but my point is you're actually absolutely right. Like the trailer it has to know exactly what the movie is going to be. And it has to communicate that in so much time. And if, you know, horror fans, especially the, the, I'd say they are less forgiving than other film audiences because, you know, one, they're extremely rabid when it comes to what they like, but they will absolutely, as you said, they will fucking turn on you and trash you up to no, no good. If you can't deliver on that. I, I would also argue that there is not a group, there is not a more uh, loyal fan base yep. out there that actually will watch. It will give it will give a shot to almost anything will. in their genre. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and, and and even if it is bad, will find qualities and you know and will just talk about the qualities of the movie even while slightly you know bashing and and be blind to the show. Yeah, exactly. I, I, absolutely. It, it, I think you yeah. find that across the board, but. The, the double edged door. Yeah. And and look, I mean, I, I hate to get like philosophical, but you know, the, as Buddha said, like, you know, expectation is suffering, mm -hmm. right? Like when we believe that we're going to, and I read more and more about this. Once I like really saw that happen, it's sort of like cascaded through my life because it's kind of like you ever you ever have pleasers in your life? Yeah. You know what you know a pleaser is, right? So so hey man, you know, would you mind? No problem. I'd love to do that, blah, blah, blah. And then they don't do it. Now, I used to take that personally. Oh, that guy's full of shit. And now I realize, oh, no, you know, they're just they they want us to be happy, but then they don't. And so we're actually angry at them. If they had said no in the moment, which is the harder thing to right. do, we would have just been like, all right, well, I expect nothing. So I'm not upset, upset. But if they go, oh, no problem, you'll have that by Tuesday and then it's not there. You, you're almost double pissed, right? Because it's expectation, right. right? And I think a lot of pain in people's lives, certainly people around me in my personal life, it's about, well, I expected to be this by this age, or I expected my movie to make this much money, or I expected my career to be going like this. And, and then it's not. And if you have little to no expectations about any of it and you let life unfold, well, then you're fine. You know, so, it, it, you know, the long and short of it is like it's it's not a perfect movie and, and uh, anyone would say that. In fact, uh, I, I'm still friends with the lead actor. And, you know, years later, like like two weeks ago, he goes, 
yeah, man, you know, I knew it was flawed because, you know, because you had that incredible script and you kind of had to hack it down. And all I kept thinking was like, I want to be in this guy's second movie. And I'm like, fuck you. You know, like, <laughs> like the, he was basically giving me like a backhand compliment. Like, yeah, you got something, but this one, you know, you're kind of both hands are tied behind your back. And, and that's a classic tale. I'm not going to fall back and be like, well, if I had the money, it'd be fucking genius. Like it, I think we, I would argue we got a lot out of a little, you know, and I would I would stand behind that movie in terms of the quality of it for how little money we actually had. Not no one would say like, oh, great job for no money. But um, but that, but then again, you don't get graded on that. The thing that Ryan and I learned really clearly was once you're a movie, you're a movie. There's no points for effort. There's no points for like, you know, best you know movie with fucking jack shit resources like you are <laughs> that'd be a good award, and it's titanic yeah like the second you're up on a big screen they're like okay motherfucker you're a walk-on freshman great we're gonna crush you and leave you with like a, you know like a some kind of cte problem you know like it, you're on you're on you're judged and that's what the reviews yeah. are like Oh, okay. You want to be on the big screen? Then I'm going to judge you with the same exact, you know, uh, uh, criteria that any other film with any other budget is going to get judged. Good luck. Personally, I don't think that's fair. I don't. I mean, well, I get why uh, it's, it's done. It I get why it's it, done. But I'm just saying, and maybe this is because you know my background in education. But I I look at it in terms of, you know. You have to take into account circumstances. You just have to. There's no way that that I would take high voltage and say, well, you know, it is not nearly the level of, say, I don't know, um, Titanic. Like, you can't do that. Well, the effect, I mean, sure, there's just pissy, like, there, commentary. Some people like the effects, some people didn't like the effects, but it's kind of pissy to judge that stuff. But, yeah, look, I mean, I get it. I get it. You know, it's it's like it's like the natural, you know, uh, welcome to the majors. Yeah. You know, like, he didn't like that call. Roy, Roy Hobbs did not like that call. Welcome to the majors, Mr. Hobbs. <laughs> like that's that's it. Welcome to the majors. And I like being in the majors. It's just it's not it's not nice. Well, speaking you know, of the, I, speaking of the majors, can you tell me a little bit about how I got greenlit a little bit about the podcast? that that you guys are on and that you created because you, you guys yeah. have come from like you know tv film and now going to podcast why'd you decide to, to jump into the podcast and and how has it gone since you've you started creating it well it's on our road to eventually dominating the pixel vision genre <laughs> um, <laughs> it's just the next media platform yeah. that we're here to no no uh it very simply uh it, it, you know it's this. Yeah. It's that we love we love the hang, and when wherever we're together or with other filmmakers, it always descends into discussion about a movie we saw, a movie we want to see, a trailer we saw, you know, business uh, kind of like gossip, whatever. It's just we're obsessed with the subject. So both as fans and professionals. So um, you know, COVID happened right. again another life changer you know and and we were stuck everyone was uh, issued their podcast license during the first year <laughs> which a lot of people yes. have given up that podcast license by the way <laughs> and and correct yeah they have right and it was like a way to get through it's kind of like sourdough baking yeah. right but um we uh we found that we really enjoyed it it was yeah it was a bit of a uh, you know, a panacea for us to get through it and, and, a, and a project. Um, you know, we had this film that we're talking about, you know, fingers crossed, I'll let you know tomorrow, Ryan, uh, if we're making. But um, that was on the precipice of being made right before COVID and then, and then it went away. So, you know, obviously we did a lot of writing. We did a lot of prepping of what we could, but eventually we were like, we just want to do something. So we set up a podcast and we started talking about it and played around. We actually, like, didn't, what is we it? actually didn't even set up a podcast. Well, I mean, set up meaning like we set up the ability to record. At, yeah. At Alex, I mean, Alex and I got on mic. We didn't, I don't even, I didn't, I borrowed a mic from Alex. Alex and we were we this I mean this literally our first episode was recorded 
out, I mean, years ago. Mm-hmm. And then we just found that our first guest was, was our first guest, it wasn't Anthony, it wasn't Tony Jaswinski, it was um, Gary. It was Tony. Oh, it was Tony. And yeah. Tony, you know, Tony. To- Tony Jaswinski wrote The Shallows, mm-hmm. but he's also, you know, my old college roommate. And uh, I said, hey, man, can we kind of like test it out on and you? And we like, had... We'll we had Easy such back. a it, Tony's a great guy. You know, he he makes his money as a screenwriter. Like he makes money doing screenwriting and he's a fan of the show and we had such a great time with him. And then we started just calling people that we knew and talking to them and um look, a, a part of it for me was and I think Alex feels similarly, part of it for me was Oh, who's going to listen to us yammer about all of this nonsense? You would about be filming. surprised. You'd be surprised. We, we, I mean, we, we're, tr- we're tracking at least 12, well, so 12 far. people in the continental United States. <laughs> and Hong and Kong. Hong, we're, we're number we're, four we're in, in Hong Kong. Japan. That's okay. Um, we're, we're really big in India, so we're going to help grow you. That's in huge. I think we have like one person in Brazil, well, and I'm like, thank you, one person things. in Brazil. <laughs> yeah. Keep keep on but, rocking. But for, yeah. for, for me, it it became a thing of like all of these people and most of the people that we talk to now have long careers and like the new season that's coming out have long careers are established uh, folks. All of their stories are varied and, and very interesting. And, and all of it for me became educational for me. My, my thing with the, with how I got greenlit is to, tell the tell a young person or a middle-aged person or an older person if they aspire to want to do this to tell stories Mm -hmm. they're gonna have to sacrifice something but also listen to all of these people who they've all ended up somehow in the the business of entertainment and they have their paths have all been so varied now there are aspects of each of those stories that i think unequivocally depend on luck and look dumb luck look guys i hate to tell you luck plays a big part in all of our lives step oh, off totally. the curb get hit by a bus totally. it, it, not get hit by a bus you know it's it, i or no better yet get hit by a walmart truck and then you get the tracy morgan money oh that's right, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> double um, sometimes no, sometimes but, people get hit with luck a few times but, yeah, and and but let me just build on that. So uh, the, it, it, he's absolutely right. I mean, my background with uh, film was I w- I knew I wanted to do it since I was six. So a lot of my childhood and young adulthood was, you know, reading books like uh, Name Above the Title by Frank Capra, which is his autobiography about making films, and you know, the biography of Charlie Chaplin, the biography of this person and that person, Humphrey Bogart, and you know, John. Uh, John Houston and whatever, just like trying to soak in. And it's all, I, I would just read the first three chapters. Like, I don't give a shit about your father and this and that and the other. I want the like, and then I left Boise for Hollywood. Right. Like, tell me that tale. What exactly did you do to get from Joe Blow to name above the title? That was what I obs- was obsessed with. That's what born Project Greenlight. That's what born how I got green lit is what is the secret formula to get what I want, which is to be a working writer, director making the films that I want to make. How did you do it? And uh, both Alex and I have had been having conversations with next chat, next chapter who helped manage us and uh, great people over there. Yeah. Great partners. And they do a lot of great stuff. And we were lucky enough to meet them through a guy named Robert Capadonna who was mutual friends and he, and he, we were lucky enough, you know, not knowing your business as well as you do that he's like, Oh, you're doing a vertical. And we're like, what's a vertical. And they're like, well, you're doing a specific subject matter for a specific audience. And you, you know, your background sort of lends itself to, to that audience and da, 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 which was kind of what we thought. Right. Like how can he, here's here, you know, here, here was an exercise for us. I'm like, okay. Uh, Here's a poster on, and by the way, I've, I've had the amazing experience of having a, you know, building size poster for Project Green that year when they, when they brought it back, it was on Sunset Boulevard as big as a fucking building. Right. And so I looked at that and I said, that's great, but what's the next poster? Right. What's the one that on the top, it says from the creator of Project Greenlight comes blank. 
And so that's a good um, that's a good exercise for anyone in this business or not in this business. You know, uh, what have you done that would lend credence to what you will do? That's a good lesson about branding. Mm -hmm. And this was as close as we could find to like that same kernel of like how shit made, you know, those like documentaries of like George Lucas bending over a model and moving a Tauntaun's, you know, arm like one millimeter, you know, just how is it made or how did it happen or how did this cool thing come about? And most importantly, filling in yourself subjectively, like any hero's journey is like, well, how can I do it? You know, so it's very self for me. And I think for Ryan too, we're like, no, give us the fuck. I don't want to hear about this and that. What is the formula? What do we do? And and I think in our new conversations that we're having for the new season and for seasons to come, the one thing that we really, really love, and Brian and John, thank you again for having us on, are You're these welcome. are these conversations. We want we if we could have a live call in show with people who and we bring in producers that we've worked with people like you know evan ostrowski who made uh cabin fever we would love to have conversations with them and be and look there is, what we've learned so far in 20 some episodes or in soon to be you know 40 some episodes there's no formula there's no <laughs> magic formula but no but and that goes back to the weird iconoclast thing i think a netflix not to use them as the catch-all but you name it google whoever comes into this town looking to you know to pick the lock they're all looking to quantize it and it can't be because it's not it's just all different stories the luck part is is the one is the one common thread but everything else is completely fucking can you joke. buy your way into this stuff yeah can you spend a bunch of money your own money and invest in it i highly recommend it if that's what you believe to be true quit your job today and do what you want to do whatever it is if it's filmmaking yes i took a big risk in my life I think you have to do it. You cannot do it. There, I have contemporary folks who knew me in my previous career who, when I said, I am going to stop doing this because the future is not there for me and I am going to start doing this. And I, and I have friends today who are like, I can't believe you actually pulled that off. Now to me, I haven't pulled off shit. I am still like, we struggle every day. I'm lucky enough to keep my head above water. I live a very good life. Um, do I have the, you know, seven million, eight million dollar mansion across, you know, down the street? I don't. And I I'm far from that. But I love every day. Uh, like I wake up and I'm like, I'm I'm like last night, Alex and I were texting until 1230 in the morning because we are on, and I'm texting with the produ other producers, and we're because there's some. I wish I could go into it, and I don't want to bury it or anything, and or be like you know secretive. But I'm also, um, uh, I also don't want to jinx anything. I'm, I'm very, I, I kind of live in that world a bit. So I was like, even if this goes bad, even if Monday everything just hits the shitter again. I don't you just love this and I wrote I texted Alex that and I was like I just feel really grateful and then I I was like hey Alex how you doing buddy and, <laughs> and the text <laughs> the text just kind of sat there for a while and I'm like oh god he's killed himself <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually the reverse it was I mean, it was I, the reverse. you know I kid, uh, I kid, I we know. you know we we were <sighs> It's funny how I, we're kind of this Mutt and Jeff act, him and I, because uh, when he's pumped, I'm blasé, and when he's blasé, I'm pumped, and somehow it's really like, how marriage. Him. It's how marriage you should yeah. work, actually. Okay. Yeah, yeah, everyone out and there, so, you want to find someone who is psychically <laughs> on the exact opposite cycle. Yeah. So in this case, like you know, uh, he he was getting down about making high voltage, and I was like, hey man. 
it's all a pyramid okay and we're like two fucking bricks from the top you know we we got the money we're making a movie uh you know we we got a bigger star to come in and that you know because luke wilson we didn't have luke wilson until halfway through the production like i i made a few calls and got some extra money and then we called him and it was just like a a last minute like ad i'm like you know we uh, we got distribution you know it doesn't matter what happens now you know we're we're in the the in, we're in the VIP room inside the VIP room waiting to get into the VIP room inside that. So be pretty fucking grateful about how many movies don't raise and money, I was like, how many movies raise money and don't get done, fucked. how many movies get da, 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 right? So I was very much like, you know, uh, to, to, to paraphrase um, the Hearts of Darkness conversation uh, that, um, you know, uh, Coppola – was uh you know oscillating between like i'm gonna blow my brains out <laughs> and like you know being um you know hitler like we don't need oil for the tanks we're gonna win this war <laughs> no matter what you know like it just uh, i forget it was uh it was milius was was quoting him it's like he was sort of like von troppen on the you know the eastern front saying we got this you know but uh the point being like by last and ryan i'll tell you this because we haven't really talked about it by last night, that whole experience of high voltage and the ups and downs. And by the way, here's some, here's another fun fact. When you do achieve a life goal, you're still the same asshole the next morning. And I didn't know that. So we had a premiere at the Chinese theater and I woke up at the you know hotel Roosevelt pool and I looked around and I still hated myself and nothing changed. And I went into a massive depression for it. And then I read about like the guy who won the Oscar for best soundtrack who blew his brains out and the marathon runner who, you know, did an ultra marathon and then, you know, had a deep depression. And there's a weird correlation between actually achieving a major goal and then realizing, wait a second, I just have to love myself on Tuesday. Not only when I like achieve shit, I'm not going to defer my self love for like, on the Oscar podium, right. right? So here we are today. And keep in mind, you know, before, well, not so much before, the, the, the project was pretty blessed. And I can tell you the whole story sometime, but the, uh, this, this car movie that we're working on was pretty blessed. It kind of had a lot of magic to it. So when COVID hit, we were like, oh no. But in this new iteration, uh, we have had a roller coaster of like huge names that you're like, Oh my God, I love him. He'll, he'll read it, you know, and then they don't do it or they want more money or they didn't read it or they don't give a fuck or the manager an asshole or whatever. So I finally said to Ryan and the other producers, I'm like, I don't want to hear about the day to day. I can't take it anymore. Just let me know. Right. If you need a rewrite, you got it. If you need a phone call, you got it. If you need me to do anything for any reason, just ask. But I don't want to know until it's and real. Then, and then, and, and so then, now it's almost and real. Then Seventeen and, seconds later, I'm getting a text. What's happening right now? <laughs> no, and I've been I've been better. I don't know if you noticed, but I've been better for it because I just I don't do that as much. And even last night, like I don't check my email every five minutes. You know, this guy is like. We're really dancing close to the edge here, guys, and it's exciting. And as I talk about it, I can get excited. But it nothing means nothing. Yeah, that's you know? absolutely. And, true. and so, and and that's and and that's not a nihilistic worldview. It's just it's just it's a worldview. And so and so the grateful comes in for me, and I think for Ryan too. Just knowing, like, hey man, we're up to bat. Like we're up to bat. And if, and if as long as we keep getting up to bat, statistically the bat will hit the ball. It's true. Now whether it's a home run or not, I don't know. But I'm just going to keep getting up to bat because that's the part that I can control. Write a good script. Write another good script. Make a good short film. Make a good commercial. Make a good whatever. Like keep doing good work. Never ever stop doing good work. And then eventually something will happen. But it's a war of attrition. It really is. And people have said it before, and I'll say it again. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow at this lunch with this fancy person at this fancy restaurant. But I do know that I can speak with passion about this project, and I can speak with passion about what led me to write it, what led me to want to make it. And that's all I can do. Whether he 
resonates with that message, I'm not going to tell him what I think he wants to hear. I'm going to tell him what I know to be true. And hopefully that'll be the right thing that he wants to hear because I can't keep up the facade of whatever it is I think he wants. You know, I'm just, my wrist will start to tire from a daily hand job over a 30 day fucking, uh, you know, shoot. He has to be my guy because that's the only way it's going to get done. I can't pretend to be his guy. Either he wants to do this or he doesn't. And we're so close on the negotiation that that's really what it boils down to. It is not about money. It is about, are you my guy or are you not my guy? And if you're not my guy, I'm not mad because I want my guy and I know my guy's out there and we're going to find each other and we're going to make a great movie. And none of this would have happened for me if I didn't leave the transmission fork factory in Muncie, Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> I got to so say, gotta say this, this whole conversation has been amazing. I'm just, I'm just being honest with you. Um, John, John hasn't even said anything. John, what's wrong with you? Are you okay? <laughs> By the way, Ryan, can we name the, can we, can we name the production company tra- Transmission Fork Factory Productions? <laughs> that should be I the name. I love that. that I've, that never, I've never suffered such an injury as I did in the Transmission Fork Factory one summer. I got a P, I ran a CNC machine and I got a I got a piece CNC music CNC factory? music factory. I want to make you sweat too. You Man, see, now no one, no one is going. No one is going to get that. No one. Did I go? I got deep? it, but I'm. Just, yeah. I don't. If CNC, if anybody, well, we're in our thirties. We know CNC yeah. music factory. We do. Yeah. We do. <laughs> yeah. My my mom was playing it when I was being borned. <laughs> um uh yeah i got a big piece of steel in my eye and oh had shit it, and had to have it and i i was like something's wrong in my eye and uh the guy's like oh yeah you have a giant steel shiv in your eye and i was like you need to go to the hospital i'm like yeah let's do that so i went to the hospital and the the metal piece is rusting in my because your eye is so sa- right. filled with so much so it was rusting and they had to vibrate this piece of steel out of my eye so look you have a choice in life you want steel in your eye or you want to work in the entertainment industry and get kicked in the balls every day just what it's equivalent, it's equivalent whichever it's like, one it's like it's like uh, what they Michael O'Donoghue, you know, or, or shove uh, sewing needles into your eyes. Um, I mean, look, it, Ryan, that tops your working on a, a Alaskan uh, fishing trawler. Oh, guys, right? I, no, I, I I dated a wonderful. Uh, I was dating a wonderful uh, actress, sea yes, captain, yes, yeah. actress uh, from Maine, and we went back, and her dad was a lobsterman. Oh, and. and uh, <laughs> He was like, son, uh, you, you want to come out on the lobster boat, you know, test my manhood a bit. I'm, I'm a big dude. I was like, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, I'm, I'll go out there. Let's go. Let's, I'll sing some shanties. And uh, we, <laughs> we went out. We went out. And my job was to bait uh, the hook and uh, the bag. They put they put uh, it, it goes uh, fish head through the eyes, then a big chunk of meat and then another fish head through the eyes. Right. <laughs> I. I I, I prefer the fish to be served with the face on, Mr. Gibbs. <laughs> That's a good one. And uh, and so I'm. Uh, he said, look, the one rule on the boat is you see this uh, pipe right here? That's the exhaust from the uh, giant engine that's underneath here. You don't want to put your hands on that. And so we're going out, and the waves are kicking up. And, of course, the first thing I do is put my fucking hand on the goddamn pipe. Of course. <laughs> And and I, I and no one sees me, you know, burn my um uh fingerprints off my hand, and so I, so I'm like, oh, that felt great. So I'm putting um, so we're on the high, you know, we're on the high seas. I'm uh, putting uh, the fish head, uh, this rotting fish head, uh, through the eyes, and then it, the eyes are so close to the front of the face that it goes basically straight through. This is, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm just gonna get this real quick because this is great. I love this story. You, I might be the only one. Um, and so, uh, uh, I put the hook, this giant hook through the fish eye and it goes through, well, the thing about fish heads is, is when they're rotting that the eyes get under pressure, right? So I put the hook through the other uh, eye and I'm breathing. Uh, I, I, I think I had a head cold or something, or I'm just a gross mouth breather. And, uh, and I open my mouth and the entire contents of a two inch fisheye eyeball jets from the eye socket straight down my throat oh my god 
And how, how did it taste? <laughs> Fishy. Fishy. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah and yeah. it is most one of the most disgusting things <laughs> I, that's ever happened to me. I was, I mean, the, it was it was bad, but yeah, and, those are. And that yeah. was the moment you realized that this relationship was not going to go anywhere I, because you're it, like, I can't, yes. I can't do the the father son bonding. <laughs> it was uh, it was captain. <laughs> yeah, I can't swallow fish eyes for the rest of my life. So. But but my gag reflex is prepared for us. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for saving that whole story, Alex. I appreciate it. And right there, I think we got a call in on this gag report. Oh no! Prepare for Hollywood. <laughs> no, uh, we gotta. Uh, we can't end on that story. That story didn't land. Yeah, oh no, a, that story landed. Well, just no, um, yeah, no, right the, down your throat. Down yeah. your throat. The great thing is, Brian. Now you could put in one of the keywords for the episode: Maine lobster fisherman. I can do that. Yes. And then wait for people who are like enthusiasts of lobster fishermen yes. to get two hours into this. Or I could just title it: How. Uh, uh, lobster fishing prepared me for Hollywood. Yeah. You know what's so you know what's so funny about that is that that exact same woman told me that the English patient had foosball in it and we needed to go see it because there was a foosball tournament in it. And I literally got to the end of the movie and was like, "There's no foosball in the English patient. What did you you lied to me?" She was like, "I'm sorry. It was the only way I was going to get you to see the movie." Oh, <laughs> you should have. You That's should have just sneaky. broke up with her for making you That's, see the English patient. I was going to say right there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I like the English patient. <laughs> um, but anyway, I want to anyway. give one shout out. Give me one shout. Uh, can I go? I want to get one shout out to Melinda Dillon. Yeah. Rest shout in out peace. To <laughs> I could not believe that she was 83 years old. That is fucking unbelievable. Really? Alex, do you know Melinda Dillon, right? Close Encounters, um, Christmas story. Yes, she was oh, eighty-three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Close Encounters, mom. Yeah, no, I know who you're talking about, but what about her? She, she died. Alive? She died yesterday. Oh, I didn't know she died oh. yesterday. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Brian, oh, I said God. R.I.P. What did you? You think I was talking about her career? <laughs> oh, <laughs> she, she, didn't, she didn't show up Take in the Christmas story. <laughs> story, you know. Bazinga. Bazinga the dead lady. See, the key is to make fun of them when they're dead, because then they can't fight back. You know? Yes, that's I, that's John's very, kind of talent very, right there. Hey, she's been very frail for ten years. You literally could have kicked her ass any time in the last ten years. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Elvis, <laughs> you fatty, fat, fat, fat. <laughs> He was on drugs too, so definitely slower than the average man yeah. at that point. And he, I think you could have like done a like a whole peekaboo thing and given him a heart attack at that point. Yeah, you know what, Genghis Khan, <laughs> he's a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> As Alex and I like to say, oh, still dead. Yeah. Still dead. <laughs> oh man, this, this has honestly been one of the most fun episodes we've done. I got to say in a long. Oh, time. Oh, that's too much. Thank I'm you. not. No, I'm not. I'm being dead serious because like I I had a whole like very serious thing like planned like you and ryan you had even like do you really do this and and i'm glad that we completely went off book because this is a thousand times more fun i hope i mean look we obviously all those questions were great i i called alex and i was like hey uh did you read this questionnaire that they did i'm like uh <laughs> Uh, this doesn't seem like them. Have you listened to their podcast? He's like, well, I, you know, oh yeah, this is, uh, I was like, did someone put you up to this, Brian? Who, who put you up? No to one this? put me up to it. It was just more or less like I looked at your guys, IMDB and I'm like, these guys are serious because we're usually used to, you know, making dick and fart jokes. all. The oh, time we love, we live. In and, dick and, and, fart and, jokes. and that, well, clearly that I is, can tell that now that that's, is, that's that, what I'm like. This uh, worked out great. As Alex says, that is our mise en scène. Well, we we like to bill ourselves as a as a our overview. Well, man, like we like to bill ourselves as like a vulgar movie review podcast. That is what we do. We we know our mm -hmm. shit, but we're also not afraid yeah. to talk about you know dick and farts and 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 boobies. So like you know. This is you're you're among friends and salt salty I, throat deposits. Yeah, salty oh, throat God. deposits. <laughs> oh, it had um, to go see, there. We just <laughs> we just want to impress you guys so we, we can meet Ben and Matt. Yeah, that's kind of what we. Were doing. Uh, <laughs> I just want to uh, meet Ben and say like, "You're not Batman." I'm sorry, dude. <laughs> you know, I actually like his Batman. Right, can I, I be honest? Right, you know that okay. he's like a colleague of theirs. So you know. I know, I know that. No, and man. and by the way, I wouldn't, I would, I wouldn't kiss his ass if I didn't like it. I wouldn't say I did. But I, in in the in the narrow bandwidth of the, like the you know too old for this shit, yeah. Batman. I thought he did okay. I really, I, did. I, I really I do. I hate the fact that we're at this point where DC has two of the most iconic 
uh, figures in our in our well dozens yeah. really but i'm just saying i'm just two. saying like yeah. it, like the as much as i would want like when i turn on is it singers uh at a like his director's cut X-Men? no no oh you uh, mean no, uh, sorry not uh, superman returns when they did the 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 director's cut that's like four hours long and in three by and four by three. Oh, you're, uh, Zach, you're talking about snyder's yeah oh not Zach, singer dudes yeah, yeah Zach snyder. snyder i i yeah, was yeah, like yeah. I didn't even make it through the first 15 minutes. And I was like, cause it was in four by three. And well, the first 15 minutes was just one slow-mo jump. (laughs) (laughs) Punch in the rain. I'm not saying that I could do any better or anyone could do any better because there's so many people. There's so many people in charge. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I could. I, 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 look, I, I don't was know. Being, I was being, I was being nice. <laughs> I'm, but I, I listen, man. Like I go back to this. Okay, I'm a. Please, if you, please. if you, if you said, "Hey, Brian, tomorrow you're going to direct the next Batman," I'd say, "Step aside. <laughs> I got this. <laughs> I got, yeah. I got like, yeah, uh, you know, 37 right. years beer. of Batman yeah. fandom coursing through my veins." I will direct the shit out of this thing. Did, I will make it R rated. I will make it Batman <laughs> that no one's ever seen, and they'll be wanting more. Uh, or not. Or not. <laughs> you'll certainly, you'll, but you'll, you'll certainly stick, you'll stick out, to your vision, you know, Brian, right? I will. And, and, yeah. yeah. And, and, well, by the way, that's, that. then you get into a whole subgenre of like, um, you know, uh, I was just listening to, they had a master and commander, uh, like, 20 whatever x anniversary it was and it was peter weir and and uh russell crowe and, and paul bettany and yeah yeah and 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 which by the way i fucking That's love that movie. movie i strongly recommend go see it again whatever it um but uh he was saying uh weir was saying look it's a fine line i mean people love these patrick o'brien books there's 20 of them there's this there's that we sort of we we built it we built it on the structure of like one book and then another book and we kind of melded it and da da da, da and we cut out this and that and you know like bettany was describing how the driver that was bringing him to set was like oh you're playing the doctor he's like yeah and he's like you don't look like him this movie's gonna suck <laughs> and, and um no, I no. mean honestly, yeah, I, I know because the doctor's described as like five four and little and this and that, and then like the captain is sort of like bigger and da 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 da, and it's kind of this like Laurel and Hardy and Peter Weir's like I don't want to get caught up in that shit. Like they, they, these are the actors; they're gonna you know get the essence. Of, this is the story. It's not quite the books, but it's sort of the spirit of it. So there's also a, a, for you as you prep your Batman film and good luck to you. Uh, <laughs> like there's, there's the other side yeah. of it, which is that you're too in love with the source material and you're too, there, there is a challenge between the literary, uh, you know, um, a, a knowledge of the source material versus like an a, a adaptation that's faithful to the spirit, but not necessarily to well, the Well, I, I, I agree with that. And, and that's, Part part of the, the reason why I think that you have, especially with these franchises, you get these like story masters, like especially with like mm-hmm. Star Wars and all that, who have to. Yes, the yeah. whole like uh, the IP, yes. like, like, like those gurus. people. Yes, I think, I I think as you said, there is a fine line, but it's one of those things where, you know, I don't know if any of those people are also filmmakers too. You know what I mean? Like, I think a lot of them are uh, like, you know, I think it's just a guardrail. Yes. Thing. They're like, well, it's you like, can't do it's this. Like, oh, Brian. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, well, here's an example. Hey, Brian, guess what? You, you know, you just got hired as a staff writer in the Simpsons next season. You come in, you got great ideas. I fucking love this show. Blah, blah, blah. Hey, what if what if Bart was a spaceman? And then the fucking guy stands up and he Bart goes, wouldn't do that. Episode 398. He already did that. Next. Yeah. Like you get to the point where everything's been done in certain like, uh, you know, IP and you got to like figure out, well, how do we make it original right. and new? So I get right. that too, but no, I'm just saying, I mean, it, it, it there's a million reasons. And, and by the way, let me, I, I'm going to pull back my, I actually like justice league. I thought it was cool. I, I gave the guy props that like, he really did get them to, let him make his you know fucking art right. movie you know and it's beautiful to it look is. at it's just kind of, i, I agree with that kind of pirates, i agree with that it's, a, it's it's so pirates. like again i'm not shitting on Zack snyder like good on you brother fucking your kid died and all this shit like fuck him 
you right. know i also want to say that it, it, during all this you say i'm going to make the movie I, I want and then john peters walks in and oh says, fuck it says, <laughs> it says you need steam powered spider <laughs> machine <laughs> let's do I it i got hold on hold on hold on everybody shut up shut up, shut up. <laughs> two words giant spider okay go do it do it I, you gotta get i mean by the way there's like two bumps taken before saying giant spider two, two. <laughs> oh, I got giant, it. giant yeah. spider yeah hey, hey say what you want yeah. most people don't know any producers names but that guy was played by bradley cooper in a fucking movie you know 100 100 percent. exactly and also started exactly. out by the way left his job as a hairdresser yep. and and oh and still has his name on superman movies by the way it's because he still controls the fucking ran a studio Studio. Ran a studio. Ran a studio. Ran a studio. Former hairdresser. I'm just and so. I think you know I, the, the 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 why I bring that all up is you know you hear the story of uh, what Kevin um, Smith's uh, Superman Superman returns. Superman, yeah. and yeah. and he is clearly not only a fanboy and some would argue his filmmaking ability, but you can't argue his. Like bona fides as knowing the source material. Right. Absolutely. Sure. And and I read that script. It's really interesting. And <laughs> and and thinking of Nick Cage as Superman and seeing him in the suit, it's just crazy. It's bananas. It's straight bananas. A lot a lot of Kevin Smith's like undone work is a little straight. You know, Clerks Three, the original version of that, had a mass shooting at the end of the movie. <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> no, nah, I was pretty that. brave. That's it was brave, like it was like right after choice. um like the shooting of the Dark Knight Rises, and he's like, I was really affected by that. So they go to premiere their movie and a guy comes up and starts shooting everybody with a machine gun. I'm like, in clerks? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but, I, but I'll say But again, good on him. Like I don't shit on anybody. If they've figured out a way in and they their will is being, you know, executed on celluloid, like good fucking The first on clerks him. for me was uh, it was monumental. It it was uh, like I loved every bit of that movie when I first saw it and had it on video, you know, VHS and I mean, it meant a lot to me. And the fact that that guy made that movie, you know, if you know the story, you know, he, he fucking clawed that movie out himself. He cracked, you know, he scraped that out himself. That's, I mean, obviously there were a lot of people that helped and there were, you know, but still, I mean, he made that movie himself. He got that made. And, you know, that, he, 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 that's all yeah. it is. It's just getting it, getting it done. Good, good for you. Merit badge accordingly, you know. And if you can keep doing it, great. I don't think this business is a zero sum business. I think a lot of people do. Exactly. I think the more, the merrier. Yes. The more, the merrier. Find your audience. Give them what they want. I mean, you know, you, one could argue Kevin Smith invented the long tail theory of like digital content, you know, and he did. I mean, he's got his 10,000 super fans and he just fucking sells them T-shirts like it doesn't matter. And he's the first guy to say it. You know, that's what I love is that he seems to have a humility about, hey, I know what I am and what I'm not. And my fans do, too. And so we're over here in this club and I'm not ever going to try to conquer the world. I'm just going to be this great indie band out of portland that like ten thousand people will always go to my show oh, the and rocket of the directors <laughs> <laughs> great hey isn't that a chicago band nice a chicago band isn't it toad the way no i don't know about that I I, you're thinking of the smithers oh, maybe i same time period i i will say though that that's a real you know that's a real thing with our podcast that i hope that we get to is that you should if it is your dream, if it is something that you want to commit to, it's not it's not you being a YouTuber. It's not being a cre quote unquote creator. It's sitting down and writing pages. And Alex has always said to me, I, I forget if this is a saying, Alex, that you picked up or but like the John John Wells. The three feet. Yeah. Somebody, you know, like everybody his story about people that meet him and go, Oh wow, I wanna I wanna do what you do. And he'll just hold his hands like three feet high. And I'll go, okay, write this much and then send me something. 
And that's that's what <laughs> you have to do. It's true. That, I mean, any you can and write about what you know. Do things that you know. Watch. There's so much stuff out there on YouTube yeah. and everywhere where you you don't even have to pay for classes. If you want to go to film school, no. you can go to film school. If you, yeah, cut it on iMovie. Like it's all there. The tools are there. The distribution there is apparatus no, is there. No there's no barrier nothing stopping. of entry anymore. Now quality is going to be a problem. There's no doubt. I'd about say that. quality and publicity. I think that's that's the yeah that's the, mostly that's the, marketing. That's the, the, the that's the differentiator now. Is, I was gonna say this yeah. earlier. Sorry, Brian. Oh no, go ahead. Gonna, man. I was gonna say this earlier that I don't know. People know this, but if a movie costs three hundred fifty million dollars, the the rule is we have to spend three hundred fifty million dollars in marketing. Yep. So if your movie costs X, it's plus X, and that's your total. Because otherwise, I, I I did this movie called Woe. Shutter actually ended up buying it. We did that movie for very little. I am very proud of that little movie. It it doesn't have a great ending, but it's a good little movie. And Shutter was nice enough to come on board, and they bought it afterwards, and they and it was great. And the movie made uh, you know paid back its investors. And I just wonder for little things like that these targeted ads and stuff. If you can figure out, there is a formula formula out there that, um, that can make it work. I'm sorry. I got a little interrupted by the ding dong of it all. Please tell me that movie starred Joey Lawrence, or that's just a missed opportunity. <laughs> it, <no. laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. No, that's it did. pretty funny. <laughs> well, anyway, guys, thank you so much for having us. This was a real pleasure. And yeah, yeah we, very, you know, uh, I, I, thank you guys. Come, no, come join us anytime. Uh, we'd love to have you on. And oh, and absolutely. I think, yeah, I mean, I think, I think you, I think it's important to have some kind of structure. I mean, in anything, but especially in this is like, have some kind of structure. Yeah. Like I, I don't ding you for like coming up with possible questions. No, not at all. Because it, it, it depends on the guest. What we've learned is some guests are super entertaining and super chatty and we just kind of wind them up and let them go. And and others, you kind of have to draw it out of them and eventually, hopefully, they warm up to it. But like, you know, yeah, we, we tend to be more of the Marx Brothers with this shit. Like, we're just going to come in and start acting the fool. I love and, it. Because we like um, talking to yeah. you. We like talking. We, you're, you're, we're each other. We're people. men that like talking to men that like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> where, where can people find How I Got Greenland? And where can they find you guys? Uh, on any major platform near you. Uh, Spotify, Apple Music, and pretty much every major platform that's out there. There, it, we will be there uh, via Stitcher, I think. Um, and uh, our partners are called Next Chapter Podcast. They do stuff like the Five Hundred and uh, great show, by the way, the Five Hundred Music Show. Yeah, so I mean, we're that we're out there. Uh, we are starting to get on YouTube um, as well. We're going to put out nice. a sort of parallel product and. Uh, and and so on but yeah basically anywhere you consume podcasts just look up how i got green lit awesome awesome it's been a hell of an episode honestly i have learned so much from listening to you guys and then also just your philosophy and just bullshitting about movies is is what i live for whenever we do these podcasts where we bring on guests so it's it's really been amazing um John, where can they find you at on the internets? Uh, you know, by this point. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, I mean, wh- wh- what am I going to say? You know, like MySpace, um, Facebook, Instagram, OnlyFans, uh, Twitter. Um, you can also. Oh, John has an OnlyFans. Oh, Hell yeah! I put what? clothes on. Watch him. <laughs> <laughs> watch him type live, yeah. John after dark. Yeah. Watch him watch him manage his uh his fantasy football team. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, did you see him replace his quarterback? Oh my god. You benched a running back? I needed a kicker, bro. Uh, watch but- him paint his figurines. <laughs> <laughs> I bet there's a fetish for that, but there um, oh, there's, there's a fetish for everything. Is, man. There absolutely is. <laughs> but uh, a friend of mine in grad school actually did nose porn. So, um but <laughs> Anyways. Is, that, is that jamming things who, in your nose? Who did nose porn? I don't know if I should. Try. Okay, that's that's because, an offline because thing. Because she wore a mask. You know, okay. And it was just close-ups of her nostrils flaring. But anyways. Uh, <laughs> also, <laughs> you can, oh, I, I had my mind 
my mind. Don't say nose porn because well, in my well, mind, John and I went to the so same many. grad school. We were in the same grad class, so like I'm going, who are who are you talking about? And then you're like, <laughs> and what is that OnlyFans page? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I start out naked and everybody starts screaming. They're like, please put on clothes. And then, Five dollars. Put on your pants now. Yeah, Five, ten dollars. I get ten. a whole winter gear, you know, and then everybody's calm again. You know, it's like. What uh, is he doing? He took a glove off. Yeah. <laughs> um, but also, most importantly for me, uh, for the plug here, is uh, J-Dub's Video Nasties on YouTube. Uh, please check that out. If you, if Ryan and Alex, if you guys are so inclined, uh, it's J-Dub's Video Nasties over on YouTube. If you like the podcast, uh, just imagine without the uh the, the orderly of nature of brian and just me being even more <laughs> vulgar yeah uh, we we i think we missed out on a vulgar john today i think you took a step back i we should do another episode where well, we just we don't hold back if you bring us onto your show john will bring his vulgar yeah oh okay <laughs> see how that works okay. yeah. that's a, that's a date there you there. go um, you can find me at, at Brian Clinton on Twitter. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and at pretty much everywhere at Psycho Show. Uh, we are also on TikTok. I don't know if you guys do the TikTok thing, but we do every once in a while. And what? that's at Cinema Psycho Show. That's We're for on Grindr. Our, that's yeah, yeah non grinder. <laughs> that that's more or less for our Gen Z audience, you know, our one of them. Uh <laughs> We also the, have the Brazil guy loves yeah, TikTok. He, he really does. <laughs> we also have our Discord channel, uh, which you can find the link for that in our show notes. There, that's kind of our our, our special. You're the, you're the select group. You know, you want to talk about the episode that gets put out. So check the show notes for that one. Do you have a name for those? Are they like called the Cinema Psychos? I think it's just Cinema a Psycho Show, but just on on Discord. No, I mean you, the people who follow. Oh, like Psychos the Nation. Men. Oh, see, you do have it. Th- okay, we do. Right. Yeah, John coined that one, Psychos Nation. I'm like, that's that's it right there. Um, but yeah, you can also, if you want to be, you know, uh, not cool and join us on Discord and send us an email at cinemapsychoshow.com. Uh, be sure to find us wherever you listen to audio, and we will see you next time. Make sure to check out Whiffs on 4K. <laughs> <laughs> Laserdisc. <laughs>